Well, hello. This is, for me, stream 274. Hope you're having a great day today. And just checking a few things here. I'm going to try to have a featured chat on my um, iPad so that I have fewer things on my main computer screen. Hey there, Nui. How are you doing? Let's see how this goes. Let me test this. I should be able to click that and then click that. Hey, it worked. Look at that. I can do that all with my iPad. <laughs> oh, technology. The only thing I have a problem with is featured chat on my iPad doesn't show the chat side by side with the on deck and now showing, so I gotta like scroll. Which is weird. Even if I put it into landscape mode. Alright. I'm gonna try to finish what I started yesterday. And it's been a theme for about a week now, which is writing a test for the Lua scripts in my game. And right now I'm working on the last script that I don't have tests for yet, which is the NPC AI script. I put together a tool to help run these tests in Visual Studio Code. It's called Moon Unit. Let me run that right now. This is the last test I was working on yesterday. So it kind of shows you the syntax of how I define unit tests for Lua scripts. So a couple extensions I use in VS Code that make this happen are a test explorer UI. So that gives you this lab beaker icon. When you click it, you get a list of all the unit tests discovered in your project. Along with that extension, there's also the catch2 and Google Test Explorer. This extension knows how to recognize and enumerate tests in your project that are using Google Test and then hook it into Test Explorer UI. So that's how I've been writing tests for things like my JSON class. They look like this. So you declare using a macro that you have a test in a certain suite of tests and you give it a name and then you basically test something using these other macros to check expectations. So our actual value is what they are expected to be. If everything passes, the test shows up in green. If anything fails, like let's say I um, change that to, oh wait a minute, I can't do that without recompiling. I can recompile, it'll just take a moment. More than a moment, it'll take about a minute. <laughs> I wanna show you guys what a failed test looks like. Yeah, the first build of the day takes longer because... Oh, it actually didn't take that long. No, it's still going. It takes longer because it's not all cached in RAM yet. But you could probably guess what will happen if I make this test fail. Instead of a gr nice green check mark, we're going to get something else, right? Something maybe a little bit more red, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, so... While that's compiling, I'll talk about... Oh, hey there, Rally Monkey. How are you doing? Talk about how this has anything to do with Lua. So Lua is a scripting language. It's not compiled, and it's certainly not supported by Google Test. So what I did is I made a program called Moon Unit that when you run it, it instead of having tests like this built into it, it actively goes out to the file system looking for Lua scripts that have tests defined in them, like this. So it basic, it's basically an execu executable program written in C++, but it has a Lua interpreter integrated into it and some support functions. So you can register tests. Your um, tests are called like any other kind of function when they're selected to be run. And there are other functions you can call to check expectations, and that fits back into the uh, overall test results. So if, the te if all these expectations are met, then your test is marked as being passed. Otherwise, it's marked as a failure. And let me just wait a few more seconds. Wow, 102 seconds to build, to link everything. There we go. All right, so if I run that test again that I messed with, you'll see that it now fails. 
So when a test fails, you get the nice red X and you can go to it and see what the expected value was and what the actual value was. And see that they're different and that's because I messed up that two and made it a three. So I have the same thing going for Lua now. Run that test again now that I repaired it. So back over here, for example, I can run that test. And if I mess with something, what should I mess with? Maybe turn that false into a true, right? And then run the test again. It will break and tell me that there's a true that was actually uh, false. And it tells me the line number and all that good stuff and gives me a stack trace even. We'd also get a test failure if I did something like an error, an explicit error message. Exactly like that. So I've been using this new framework uh, to build up unit tests for my game's scripts, which are all written in Lua. Uh, I forgot to mention one thing. The reason why this works in Test Explorer with Google Test is the program Moon Unit that finds and executes tests also mimics Google Test's output format. So for all that Test Explorer and its plugins think, Moon Unit is just another C++ unit test suite with Google Test. But actually, it's fooling it. It's really running Lua scripts. So the way I have game Lua scripts built in is through my entity component system. One category of entities are the scripts. And here's a view of my game. George is an NPC in the game, and he is running the NPC AI script right here. It's quite long. It was about 900 lines. So along with all the other scripts in the game, I've been building up unit tests because working on George's NPC AI script was leading me to realize that I don't have enough testing and bugs are very hard to track down and there are a lot of lot more bugs than I expect. So I went back and I've been building up tests for everything. NPC AI was the biggest, so I kind of saved that for last. Yesterday I made uh, tests for about half of the pieces of NPC AI. I decided to break it up into pieces, so a bit of refactoring. And I made tests for the first four pieces, so I have five more to do today. The last one being just the out outside shell. Let me test this thing. Rally Monkey asks, what will it think when it finds out the awful trust? Truth, you mean? Uh, it will never find out, Rally Monkey. It will always think that it's Google test. <laughs> so Rally Monkey, I'm using my iPad now to do the featured chat. So... I have one fewer window overlapping and cluttering my computer right now, but there, that's why I'm looking down for featured chat. So I'm having to scroll up, pick a message, then scroll down and click the on deck thing. But it's, I think it's better than cluttering my workspace up. But as, as always, if you'd like to, just feel free to pick any message. If you have the uh, capability of doing the featured chat. Uh, any of my moderators is welcome to pick any message from chat and put it either on deck or in the now showing so that if someone asks a question and I start to answer it, we can, we, we can feature the question over there on the left side of the, the bottom left side of the screen. All right, so as, as always, let me just say, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in chat and tag me if, I, if it looks like I didn't see your question. I have a lot of commands that describe what I'm doing and answer frequently asked questions. So, for example, there are the links to both my game and my notebook. So I keep a plan for every day. And it's more of like an objective, not something I will absolutely get to. And sometimes I will deviate from this plan. Sometimes I will um, get through the plan and do other things, but that's pretty rare. Usually I get partially through and continue the next day. But a record, I, I put all my notes on the same plan pages. A record of all my streams are in here. So, I guess today I'm starting with the Wander script. So going back to NPC AI, which is what we're pulling things from and refactoring, uh, I'm going to be looking for the Wander script. 
It's at the top where I expected it to be, since I kind of went through this file from top to bottom when I was deciding what pieces I want. So let me just take the wander script and make a new script called mpc wander and paste it there. And we're deciding to make this a global function, not local to the mpc AI system. And we're done. So let's make a unit test for that. What's the one I did yesterday? The last one I did. Tether. Okay, so let me take tether test and make a copy of it. Call it MPC Wonder test. Because there's some boilerplate here that um, would rather reuse parts of it rather than figure it out from scratch. So when I'm going to build a test for an existing function, it's kind of backwards from what I'm used to doing. I'm used to writing test first, which is the test-driven development, TDD and all that. But for Lua scripts, I did the wrong thing in just jumping in and making scripts. I think at the time I was thinking, these scripts are just temporary any, anyway. They're turning out to be a little bit more permanent than I thought they would be. So I'm kind of making up for that mistake. I'm coming back and adding the tests that are basically missing. So when doing that, I inspect the function that already should work. I mean, we found a few bugs in making these tests, but mostly these are working. Just look at the working script and see what are the pathways through this code. And we'll construct a test that exercises the different pathways. So wherever we see a return or an if, we're going to look for what what is it that we're checking and why are we returning and try to make a a scenario, uh, a test example that exercises the code through that path. So what this function does specifically is it checks to see whether or not an NPC should move, and if so, where, when they're in this mode of wandering around aimlessly. So it's working with a table called context, and that's mostly to make the different variables associated with an NPC's AI logic sort of grouped together for convenience. And so we're pulling five things out of it. The NPC's main component, a table that we're going to use to put changes we want to make to the NPC, the NPC's entity ID, so their ID number, the position of the NPC in the current time in the game. And we're going to look into the NPC's component and look at this NWT. I think that stands for next wander time. And we're going to say, if we have a next wander time, and the current time is less than that, then we're returning early. So that's effectively a cooldown. Whatever NWT is set to, if it's set, then we're going to wait until the time reaches that before we decide to do a next wander step. Otherwise, it would the NPCs would be wandering around really, really quickly. Basically, every game tick, it would make a step, right? So if we get past that check... It's going to compute what is the next wander time, is the current time, plus some kind of random number to pick between the minimum and maximum wander cooldown. So that's just to make it kind of, so that they don't, it's not like they're marching while they're wandering around, like regular intervals they move. It's more of like irregular, kind of aimless, right? And then we get a table of directions they might move in and pick a random direction, Com compute the destination coordinates based on their current coordinates and then adding this... Uh, step to it and then checking if the npc can move to that position then we will let me read this right we're doing two things here for this next wander time we want to put it back into the npc component but the way i designed my entity component system the systems, which is what these Lua scripts are, aren't allowed to directly modify the components. They can only make requests of the game to go do the changes. And that's for one big reason, is that the game is running on multiple servers in a cluster. And so we can't just change the component locally. We have to spread it across the entire cluster. And only when enough servers in the cluster have verified they have received that request will the change actually be done and it's actually done by another component in the system called the executor so it's kind of like a big feedback loop and this is feeding back what we want to change so we're changing two things we're asking uh, to change the next wander time and we're doing this through this 
in NPC Delta. And the reason it's done through this t table is that there might be other changes to the NPC that the N NPC AI might do. So it's kind of like an optimization. Whereas this one is directly going to send a message to the game saying, I want to modify the position component of the NPC and set the position to that. Consensus? Yeah, so it's the raft consensus algorithm. So you essentially can't make changes to your data immediately. You have to put them into a journal or a list of change requests, get that replicated across the majority of your servers, and then you can apply the change. So because that's an asynchronous operation, we can't just sit here and, and uh, do it, and it would waste time to wait for it. So we just basically we're queuing it to happen later. All right, so the pathways through this code are this one where there's actually two conditions. Either the next wait time isn't set yet. We'll skip it. If it's set and it's less than, the current time is less than that, then we return early. Or it could be it's set and the time is greater than or equal to it. So there, there are three pathways really through this. And one of those, pa actually two of those pathways, we would end up either going and modifying the NPC's position or not. So we don't really, really need to cover exhaustively every single possible path. I'm okay covering maybe this return either two ways, either, uh, no, there's only one way. Let's take that back. The one way would be that this is true and this is true. They're both true together. So that's one condition, and we can, we can test that. And then I think I'm okay with um, just checking when um, the time is greater than or equal to. And then having two pathways, we either move or we don't, based off of uh, the, the result of this. So we're writing a unit test, which means that we only want to test this function. These other functions we don't want to test. So we do a technique called mocking. That's where instead of calling the real math random, we're calling the real modify component delta, we're going to substitute those functions with, with smaller functions that are just geared for tests so that it's we're just testing this function only and we're basically simulating the behavior of these other things. We also have to do that simulation or you know um, our own implementation of math random to remove the randomness from the testing. This is explicitly going to have a different number every time, right? But when we, want, when we write tests, we're making scenarios that need to be predictable because we need to check are the results what we expect. So uh, you could sort of do that with random numbers if off to the side you knew what the random number was uh, end up being and then you, have a, a, you, you compute your expected value. But I think it's better to just have a predictable value in sort of like a, a pre-played scenario and just check to make sure that it works the way the way we want. Yeah, you could do it with a seed too. That way, math random returns the same thing. But I figure why not? It's easy enough to just have our version of math random return a predictable set of numbers to cover all the cases, right? Specifically, it's whatever we set math random to return through this equation, we'll expect that it'll end up in NPC delta, and we can check that. So let me, let me, the, all the code here is copied from some other test, so it's just here if I need it. Let me just build up the scenarios here. Um, not yet, well, wandered, wander, cool down, wander, not yet cooled down one scenario and then the other one will be wander cooled down can't move to chosen destination well even though they're not really complete senses I'll end it with a period <laughs> you know about Paxos but never heard of raft it looks awesome yeah, uh, Adam13531 suggested it to me. He's a smart guy. 
and I think the whole point of Raft, if you read the white paper, it's it's supposed to be a, a much easier to understand and implement. And in fact, it includes a scientific study amongst uh, students to figure out which one's easier to learn, Paxos or Raft. And he, the Diego, the inventor of Raft, claims to have this evidence collected through this study that Raft is easier to understand and all that. And, and hey there, Igrok. I forgot to say hi. All right. This one is wander, cool down, can move. Okay. So ultimately, we're going to call that all three times, right? So then just get that out of the way. And we're going to want the context to have those things in it. So NPC is needed. The only thing from NPC that we need is the NWT. So if it's not yet cooled down, it means what? A, some value in NWT that's greater than... No. It's less than or equal to the current time. No. <laughs> greater than. Greater than. Or equal to. So, I don't know, 150. And let's say, let's put in time there. 123. So at 123 would be less than 150. NPC Delta. I'm just going to declare that as, as a separate table. Just because. Actually, I have reasons. Mostly it's because this is something I want to uh, expect to be modified, and this not, not so much. NPC Entity. NPC entity is used for what? It's only going to be passed to that function, so we just need to make sure it's what we expect. Let's just make a test NPC entity. And just declare that as some kind, some kind of local constant. 42. And then I need a position. What's position used for? Right, it has an X and a Y, and some number between negative 1 and 1 will be added to the, each of those and given back to this function. Uh, so we can put whatever we want as long as what we what we use we need to match with what we expect later. Okay. Although I guess for this case it doesn't really matter, does it? Because we're going to return early. So all we need to do is expect that it returns false, and we should also expect that that's not called. So let's have. In sort of an arrange, if this is an act section, this is an arrange, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Let me get this thought completed and fill it in a second. This kind of goes into a range too, right? Like that. Windy Beard Games is hosting me. Hey there. You might be actually watching an ad, so well, let me wait for what I would imagine a typical ad would be. I don't know, 10, 20 seconds. Either that or Windy Beard Games will say, hey, I'm no longer watching a stupid ad. And then he'll be able to hear what I say. What do we think? What, what kind of ad do you think might be playing? One of those beer commercial ads? I like those because they're shorter. Hey there, ad for, you're done with any potential ad. How are you doing? Thanks for the host. I hope you had a great stream. I th I I was uh I was looking around at different streams this morning, just kind of quickly jumping through them. And I saw you were playing. I think you were playing Luigi World. I'm like I ne never knew that was uh something uh, out that I didn't. What am I trying to say? I didn't think that there were that 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 there had been made a Luigi World game. I'll have to play that someday. <laughs> A Luigi's Mansion 3. Okay. Why did I think Luigi's World? I don't know. World? Super Mario World? Maybe. Cool. It was released today. I mean, it looked pretty uh, pretty cool. I had no idea if it was new or old or what. I'd never heard of it before. Anyway, thanks for the host. Uh, let me describe to Windy Beard Games viewers what I'm doing. 
I'm uh, working on my own game. It's a retro RPG multiplayer, but it's using my own engine. So it's a bit rough around the edges and not complete yet. This is what kind of kind of looks like right now. And this is mostly a test area. It's a, a lot of different programming languages and technologies here. I'm not an artist, so my art isn't that great. Don't know if I'll hire an artist or not. I just kind of want to see if I can get the mechanics of the game going and interest into it. Uh, but the back end of the game runs C++, but hosts a Lua interpreter. And the Lua interpreter is used to run the game systems. And one of the scripts in the game systems controls what the NPCs do. So for example, these slimes kind of just wander around aimlessly. And then we have George, who's a little bit more intelligent, but he's got issues. So for example, he kind of patrols this area, and if he sees one of these slimes, he'll try to get to them and, and defeat it. But he doesn't know that he can't cross the water until he tries, and so he kind of gets stuck. So I've been working on improving his logic to use pathfinding so that he, if he so chose, he could get to that slime by pathing all the way up and around here. Alternatively, he can just ignore the slime because it would be too long to get there, right? While working on those scripts, I realized I needed to have more testing because I was running into bugs and I didn't have a good set of tools to catch those bugs other than you know, just brute force print statements, right? So I've been beefing up the test environment for these scripts, basically adding tests, and I have now a way that I can make tests kind of the same way that I make tests for C++ code. So these are unit tests that a test runner uh, can find and execute within the context of Visual Studio Code, kind of the same way that I do the same uh, for my C++ components that look like this. I'm used to Google tests where you make tests like this, and so I kind of made the similar thing for Lua using a little adapter I made called Moon Unit. Since Lua is Portuguese for moon, and we're making a unit test framework, and I think Moon Unit is a cool name. It's Frank Zappa's daughter, right? <laughs> It's an interesting name. So I'm like, let's call it Moon Unit. And it's a little adapter that looks like Google Test. It fools all the tools into thinking it's Google Test, but it's really running Lua stuff instead. So I'm busy taking these scripts from my game and writing unit tests to make sure all the little parts of that script do what they should do. So... Yeah, my project is a bit big. I've been working on this for over a year, and it's taking a lot longer because I'm doing the engine myself. And a lot of people ask me, why am I doing the engine from scratch? Uh, I'm kind of different in my stream in that I like to do stuff from scratch that's fun rather than pick up existing libraries. Not everything to me is fun. So, for example, the connection between the front-end JavaScript and the back-end C++ is over a, a web socket that uses SSL. And I, I didn't find the SSL fun enough, and I didn't trust myself to do it right to avoid security problems. So I'm using an existing library, LibreSSL, which is a fork of OpenSSL. And another example would be Zlib. I'm like, compression? Nah. Also, I'm not that good at understanding how compression works, so I'll just pick up the Zlib library. But pretty much everything else I wrote myself, and so that's, it's taken me a, a long time to get to where I am, and the engine is still not done. So... The development's a bit slower. I don't have a lot of existing libraries that I'm leveraging. Although on the front end side, I do use React and Phaser, so I didn't have to figure out the WebGL stuff, which is a little bit interesting, but I'd rather I'd rather get to that later maybe and just use Phaser for now. So um, I really like things like taking Lua script interpreter and embedding it into a program. I've done that several times now. I've done the same thing with Perl and Python and I've made other programs using those. That kind of stuff is fun for me. So that's why I did it. Other game engines do have scripting in different languages than the engine. So for example, World of Warcraft's front end also uses Lua. And I think uh, so does Factorio, that uh, automation game. It uses uh, heavily uh, Lua scripting for add-ons and such. So kind of following the footsteps of those other games, but uh, having fun and doing it myself. Anyway, if you guys have any more questions, let me know. I have lots of commands to describe what I'm doing. And like those links that I have that command game before posted, you can check out my game now. It's online. It's really just a test environment right now, though. 
There's also a link there to my notebook where I kind of come up with a plan of what I'm working on today. So what I'll be doing is building up the rest of the tests for the existing NPC AI logic. What about the... Oh, shoot. I forgot about that $10,000, Nui. I'll have to remember to write you a check later. <laughs> That you 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 waited a, a quite a while, hoping that I'd forget, and then, and then I'd remember. Oh oh, that's right. It's Rally Monkey's ten thousand dollars. <laughs> Is it playable? Yeah. So let me demonstrate with. You go to omniarania.com, You'll get to that, and you. It used to be that you did a new account. You'd have to pick a player name and a password and all that. But I recently added this um, uh, login with Twitch, and that will um, bypass picking a password. So it doesn't even store any credentials in my game system. It just leverages Twitch's open ID stuff. So I've already done that, and so um, it'll show you this to make sure that um, you're okay with um, my game uh, checking out your identity from Twitch. And let me do that off screen because it will, um, if I hit authorize, it's going to flash the JWT on screen. Anyway, I didn't want to show that on screen. You'll get to here, and here's the game. And you don't show up here when you start, but you show up here soon after. The idea I had in this initial area, it would be sort of a tutorial. And George is mostly here to help introduce you to some of the game mechanics. So I don't have it yet very user friendly, but ultimately you'd, you get into a discussion with George here. And he would guide you to say, you know, you, you exercise the dialogue system. And at some point he would say, I can lead you out of here. Would you like me to? Yes. And then, um, okay, I need, I need to get rid of the slimes because they're interfering with what he's doing. Let's move them over here so that George fights them later. <laughs> so he'll basically path to the exit of the level and on his way up, oh, he's stuck again. So these guys, these slimes get it, get get him stuck. See what he's doing? He's fighting all the enemies for us. He returned back to where he was before he saw the slimes right there. That's why he pathed back and then forward. So you can log in now and have the same epic experience of uh, talking to George and having him lead you out of the level if you want. It's not much to the game other than this. Yeah, we'll get there though. I mean, mostly it's because I um, haven't um, finished the engine that I haven't had a, a lot of chance to work on the game content. But this is kind of like showing you the, the essentials of what the game will have later. It's going to be a 2D tile system, retro graphics and art, art graphics, same thing, I guess. Um, rudimentary sound effects. Uh, but you can imagine later I'll be adding spells, I'll be adding other particle effects, other things you can do, larger inventory, equipment slots, other things like that. So pretty much bare bones right now. But it's got some of the, some of the elements you might expect. So the game will tell you dialogue. It'll also tell you if you pick up or you drop items. You can move items around in your inventory. Later you'll be able to see what those items are and then use them. Right now, they're just sort of props that don't do anything. Time to speed run. Here you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the the only really thing you can accomplish in the game is get George to go to the stairs and then go back. <laughs> and hey there, Flamehead. Oh, one, two. Oh, and then Perry said something. How are you doing, Ed Perry? So yeah, to, so the. Part of George's script is when he is not leading someone out of the dungeon, he's basically wandering around or patrolling this area. So this is the wander script right, script right here. It is run every game tick, so there's this initial check to make sure, should we do something yet? This is sort of like checking against a cooldown. NWT stands for next wander time. And we'll see, is it time to wander yet? Nope, return. But it, when it becomes time to wander, we'll pick a random timeout for the next time we wander to make it look kind of, you know, aimless. And pick a random direction and try to go there. And it'll ask the game, can an NPC move there? If so, request them to be moved there. 
And returning true means we actually did something, whereas false meant we didn't act. So now I say hi. Well, I was having to introduce Windy Beard Games viewers to what I, what the heck I'm doing. So I'm sure there are people who are like, how did I end up here? I was watching Windy. Now who is this weird guy? <laughs> what is he doing with with this strange programming language? It looks horrible. No, just kidding. Hey there, Slickver. Why no wave to stream elements? Because stream elements is a friggin' bot. <laughs> did stream elements actually say something? I guess it did at some point. Oh, uh, announcing the, ho the, the host, yeah. This doesn't look like WinCEXL. Nope, it doesn't. This entire initial area should be preserved even after you fleshed out the game world with proper... You mean for nostalgia? For the people who watched me work on it? I guess I could. You want to you want to drop in and just hey, say hi to George? Okay. Yeah, I'm sure the game will, if it becomes successful, will have to keep these old things for people who remember it being developed. And uh, I guess I would monitor to see, does anyone still care? And if no one does, then I guess they, I'd archive them and shed a few tears. So let me log out there. Let's re resume working on this script. I'm going to try today to get back on task and balance that with chat. So doesn't mean you can't ask me questions and derail me. That's fine. But I will need to get back to this. I want to try to get to this today in the next four hours. You cannot archive George. Sure I can. George is just a bunch of data. Look, here's George. That's George. Well, that's part of him. And then he also, here's his position. Here's his tile. Here's his movement capabilities. That's all that he is. He is 18145. <laughs> if I click that button and say yes, he will cease to exist. <laughs> that was close, George. Whew. Avoided destruction there. Oh, that's right. We do have a subreddit. I don't use the subreddit much other than we have a... I, I put it there as a placeholder for now. Feel free to post there if you want, but it's mostly just to make sure no one um, grabs it. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't know about the subreddit, Rally Monkey? Huh. I thought for sure I told you about it. Okay. So, this is the uh, sort of test scenario, and I need to fill in a mock for this. I think actually the mock, it's going to return something different for these two, because one scenario we, we want to return false, and the other one we, we want to return true, right? We shall rebuild George if you take him away. I have only just met him, but I shall defend at all costs. Well, I did show all of the data on, on stream there, if you... If you grab that, um, you could have a digital copy of George in all his glory. Oh, well, all of his data, but none of his scripts. But then again, we're looking at part of his scripts, so. <laughs> it's all checked into version control, too. So if I destroyed him, I, I could re recover him from Git. Okay. How do I want to write this mock? The mock actually isn't needed for this first, what do we call it? Subtest this first test step, but we will we will need it here. I think what I'll do is, given this position, we'll have him try to move, wander up and say he can't, and then he'll try to move to the right and he can. So that'll be a simple check, right? We'll say if new x equals four, then return true. Else return false. Actually, I can abbreviate that, right? I can just say return n x equals four. Uh, but we should also check some other things, right? We should check that the context is the same context we, we passed in. And because those names are the same, I need to make them different. Let's, make th let's do that. And then I can just do an expectation check. Expect that test context is what context is. And then we uh, might as well expand this a little bit. Let's say if it's for... We're going to return true, but we should also expect that um, ny is another value, right? If we're moving to the right, actually it shouldn't be 4, it should be 3. 2 plus 1 is 3, not 4. 
If we're moving to the right, then the Y coordinate shouldn't change, right? Else, I guess what we'll do is we'll expect an X to be 3. And then we can, we can just, because we know what we're going to pass in next, we'll expect um, 3 for NY, no, 2, two for NX and 3 for NY. So it, the one move will be 3 by 4, and the other one will be 2 by 3, right? Okay, and then return false. Because that's going to say we can't move up, but we can move to the right. If water, then go around. If only it was that easy. I know. You'll defend to the death his right to determine his next pathfinding step? <laughs> So right now he's just single he's just obsessed with going straight to that slime until that happens where he snaps back out because he's got a tether roughly that keeps him in this patrol area see how he kind of he's like oh I need to get that slime oh I'm too far away I need to return here he, sometimes he ends up bouncing back and forth because of that but yeah soon he'll be smart enough to tell I can't get there within five moves so I'm just not going to bother with that slime if water were walkable George would immediately go slay it. So let me, I could show you that. I can just make him capable of walking over water. There. Look at that. Now George is like, ha ha, I got you at last. Change him back so he can't move on. Oh, now he's stuck on that side of the bridge. Can't have that. I could put a bridge there too, but then that would kind of short circuit the tutorial. I want the path to be like this for new players. <laughs> If item boots equipped water, yeah. So you kind of see how it would work, right? The caps has an M for movement. If it's three, that means that he can move both on ground and water. You would ima ima imagine that you would have some boots of water walking. When you equip them, you would change your ca caps, your movement caps, to be um, to add to set the, the two bit. The same thing happens if you are uh, if you enter a boat and now you are on a boat and you're moving the boat you would your movement would change from one to a th to a two so you can no longer move the boat on you can no longer move on ground but you can move in water so that's how i'm going to be controlling the movement of both players and npcs and players and npcs in the game is through this movement capability which is what this can npc move to position the real one actually kind of does among other things like he can't move through walls, but also if there was another player here, he can't, um, or another NPC, he can't move. Hold on. I made it so that George could actually move on top of them. But if, like, one of these slimes, they can't move on top of each other, even if it's still a ground tile, because I have an extra check to make sure they can't step on each other. All right, so that's a mock for can NPC move to position. Let me also mock that. And I've already written that many times, so let me just copy it from somewhere else. Come on, search. Find it. First search of the day is always slow. Yeah, here we go. So this kind of mock is mostly just collect the information and we'll check it later kind of a thing. So make a deltas table. Here's the mock. It says, when it's called, just take the arguments as is and just put them into the end of this deltas list. What else do I need? Actually, that's... Oh, no, we need, we need to simulate math random, right? So where have I mocked that? Here we go. Here's where we were mo um, testing the dro loot drop system. So it's kind of fun. We'll have to adjust it. This one was when we drop loot from a monster, 50% chance and we get some by rolling under 0.5. 15% chance as long as we roll under 0.15, which we did. And then we don't get the legendary gem because you have to roll below 0 0.0001 and we didn't. So let me repurpose this. So in this scenario, the first one, Wander Not Yet Cooled Down, will have no roll happen at all. And then um, the second one, it will do two random number rolls, right? One for the next wander time and the other one for the direction. 
The first roll is no arguments, like that. And the second one, is we're going to expect a 1 to 4. Okay, now what are we going to roll? For can't move, I decided that would be if we tried to move up. And up is 3, right? Key 3, that's 1, 2, 3. So, 3. And then about the next wander time, it's really just so we can make sure we compute the correct... I mean, no, let me back up. This role is to figure out what to set for next wander time, which we can check in... It'll be stored in this NPC delta, right? So I can put whatever I want. I'm going to try to keep it simple. Let's do exactly 0.5, right? These are also dependencies, technically. They're constants, so we can make them whatever we want. Or are they? They're dependencies if they're in common. No, they're not. They're just things I need to move. Okay, never mind. Let's move them to where they need to go. All right, so between 0.5 and 5, what would be halfway through? That would be 4.5 divided by 2, right? 2.25 plus 0.5. Am I doing my math right? 4 by 5 divided by 2, add to the minimum, 2.75. Okay, so add 2.75 to whatever time is. So let me put that in a document here. NVIDIA typing will, will get time plus 2.75, right? Right, so it's minimum plus random times max minus min and that's whatever we return which is point it's always a number between zero and one if min and max are nil that's just how lua's math random works okay and then the last case can move which is a move to the right so to get it to move to the right we want to simulate uh a, the right would be this one a two And then let's pick a different value for this. Let's say uh, a 1. So point, uh, 4.5 times point 0.1 is point 0.45, plus point 0.5 is point 0.95. All right. I think that's correct. So let's both act and assert our conditions are met here. Right, so it's going to return something. Moon unit, expect true. Only this one will be a false. The other ones will be true. When this one's a false, I just want to make sure that's not called at all. Maybe I will put in a little variable about that. Can NPC move to position was or was, was called, and just like set it to true here. We'll need to check it and then reset it for the next, next test. So moon unit, expect false that. And then these though, will expect true. Okay, what else? That's actually it, right? Oh, actually, we can ex... Well, I guess we should also expect deltas is empty. Deltas. And then reset deltas. So putting that there would be nice. Okay. So when we can't move... Expect that we did check, but then no deltas were done, right? But then here we will expect some deltas. We will expect this thing. 
the delta that we expect will be this x equals something, y equals something. Uh, we said it would move to the right, right? Right, so it will be 4, uh, I mean, uh, what am I thinking? 3, 4, x equals 3, y equals 4. We have the right number of curly braces. Yeah, there. And then the entity should be test NPC entity. Component type should be position. Oh, we should also check this next wander time. Yes, so we can do that at the last. Expect equal. What did I start it at? 150. 150 for MPC next wander time. Actually, it's going to be MPC delta, and it won't be in here at all. Right? And then I'll want to reset it afterwards. And if I do that because I have a copy of the reference here, I'll want to reset that too. And then another thing I can do is I can just take all of these resets and put them together and call it like reset test. And then just make that a, a, a local. Like so. And then just do that there. OK. And then NPC delta can, well, it will cool down. So we'll, we will expect a next wander time. And then I said it would be time plus 2.75, right? Uh, right here. And the time was in uh, test context dot time, right? Cool. And then this will expect point z zero point nine five. All right, are we ready to run the test? Yes. Run the test, Lua. Oh, it didn't work. Nothing works the first time. If it works the first time, I get really sp suspicious. Okay, it returned false, even though it should not have. This also returned false. There was no next wander time. Oh, I know why. I didn't actually change the next wander time. Or I didn't change the time. Yeah, I want to I wanna move the time so that it's beyond the next wander time, right? For this test, time equals, um, let's just pull from the next wander time. It was NPC, right? Yes. And then we'll just uh, either hit greater than or equal to, right? We'll have this one test that when it's equal, and we'll have this one test when it's greater than. Just to have good good coverage there. All right. We got further. We got down to 73. That's the only one that failed. That the value is missing. So it actually didn't store it in NPC Delta. Why not? Why would it not? It should have. Oh, wait a minute. No. It can't move, so it doesn't reset it. Is that what I want? So then it would just end up trying again later. Like the very next tick. Actually, I don't want that. That's a bug. Because what if the NPC gets trapped? Then he'll constantly be running this over and over and over again, even though we already tried to move. I think I'm going to change this. So we will put that down to here. Now it passes. Yeah, because that's what I kind of want. I want it to go on cooldown, either if we move or we don't. 
Yeah. Okay, I like that better. Cool. Then we're done. We're done with one fifth of today's work. Yay! <laughs> now aggression. Pursue enemies. Pull and drop aggro. Let me find it. Oh, did I not remove that? I copied it but didn't remove it. Okay. Oh, while I'm at it, um, I'm not while I'm at it. It just occurred to me that the name might need to be changed, right? It says Act Wander. Let's just call it NBC Wander. Or maybe Try Wander? Or just Wander? Wander. NBC Wander. I need to make that something I search for place everywhere, though, because it's called from NPC AI right now. NPC Wander. Changed. Done. Okay. Hey there, Resubaka. How are you doing? Pursue or return is one function. Is that the only thing I need then? There's only one function for pursuit? No, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold the horses. Pursuit was something I did yesterday. Is this something I missed yesterday? Pursue or return? What's the return part? Oh, this is a higher level function. This is saying if we have aggro on an enemy and we can attack it, then do so and return. If we couldn't attack anyone, check the tether script to see if we should return home or if we're in the middle of returning home. And then if we fall through that, we might pull aggro. And if we pull aggro, we might try to attack them right away. And if we couldn't attack anything, and we have aggro, try to pursue them. So this, where would this go then? Does this, is this part of the aggression? Is this what I meant by aggression? I think it was. Hey there, TS Just. TS Just asked, I'm enjoying this refactoring testing NPC A. Lewis scripts. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad you're enjoying it. For me, I have mixed feelings because I think a lot of people don't like Lua. We're looking at code and we're not looking at cool graphics. It's like looking at a mountain through a microscope for a lot of people, I think. I'm trying to get this done so that I can get to more fun fun stuff for other people. I, I like the idea of having tests back up all my scripts so that if I mess something up, the, the test will fail. So... I'll enjoy it once I'm done. Right now, it's sort of a chore. <laughs> okay, I think I did... This is what I was calling a, the aggression system. Basically, this is where we an NPC does their attacking. But they do some other things not dealing directly with aggression. They also do the tethering. Maybe I don't want to call it aggression. It's aggression, it's tethering. That's actually it. Pulling, does it actually drop aggro out here? It does. We drop aggro if we tried to pursue someone and we couldn't move, right? Or we couldn't pursue. If we can't pursue an enemy, then we drop aggro. If basically the target wasn't found. If they go invisible or they get beyond range or something. Everything about this is, is tied to the aggression of an NPC, except for this part. It conjures the image in my mind of a guard dog that's tied by a, uh, like, a flexible leash to their dog house. So it's like everything about this is about attacking and pursuing, unless they get too far away and then the tether kind of yoinks them back. You know, I'll just I'll go with I'll just call this the aggression system. That's 
even though it has this aspect of tethering, that's fine. Uh, that's what I'm going to be copying into a new script. So cut NPC aggression paste. And let me rename this everywhere. NPC aggression. Rename. Now that it's a top level function, it needs to be global and not local to the AI system. What other dependencies might I need here? No constants. It's not using any constants. It has some of this old code. Maybe I should just take the opportunity to trim it out now. Yeah, I probably don't need this, right? These are like print statements when I was debugging. Don't need any of that right now. I might put it back in later. Hey there, Romania. Hey, how are you doing? I'm okay. My hair is getting kind of long. Need a need a haircut, but other than that, I'm fine. Today's going to be a busy day with Halloween, so I'm going to be the one at my house who is staying home and handing out the candy while everyone else goes out and gets candy from other houses. It's kind of a weird thing if you think about it. It's like the, the great neighborhood candy exchange. Hey, give our kids candy. We'll give your kids some candy too. <laughs> and we give out the good candy. We give out the full on candy bars, like the full size candy bars. Not the, not the, not the treat uh, size, but the full on big ones. Be careful not to run out though. It's cold over there. Here it's, here it's dry. It's dry and kind of cool. It's very dry in California right now. Time to drive to my house. I don't know how how's the your neighborhood rally monkey. Mine is pretty uh, active. I a couple of years for a couple of years I was actually counting the number of kids that would stop by and it would get in like over a hundred. And I would worry about running out of candy some years. More and more kids. It snowed in the mountains there. Is if you like snow, that's awesome. If if you hate getting stuck in the snow like me, maybe not so much. <laughs> not that many for you. Not like over a hundred. Yeah, I, we get easily over a hundred, and they come in like gangs of twelve to fifteen sometimes. Which I guess is not a bad thing. It's like instead of one after the other constantly ringing the doorbell, we get one doorbell ring, process fifteen kids, then go back to doing what we were doing. Need to go to the U.S. for Halloween at some point? You want to experience what it's like celebrating it? There are different ways people celebrate it, right? There's trick-or-treating, which is just door-to-door -to -door candy exchange and kids have fun dressing up. And there's also parties. So I haven't been to one of those in a while, but um, that's more of an adult thing. You still get, still get to dress up. You still get candy if you want, but usually it's just an excuse to have a party. <laughs> okay. There's a bunch more context in this test. Let me make a test. NPC aggression test. NPC aggression. All right. We have enemies. It's expected to be a table, I bet. Yeah, it, well, it's supposed to be a list. When we see I pairs in Lua, that means it's a, a list or an array. Lua is kind of weird in that the same underlying data structure is used for both a list and a dictionary. It's just a list is a special kind of dictionary where the keys are all integers starting with one. And iPairs pair, I works with that kind of table. And it gives you, uh, underscore I mean here means that I don't care what the index, it would be the index otherwise, um, and the value. So we're just looking through all of the enemy infos in the enemies list. And we're seeing if that enemy is not in our aggro dictionary, then see how far away they are. If they're within aggro range, then target that enemy. If we have a target and they are... So basically this uh, distance thing and this... Um, where is it? target distance is finding the closest one. So if we find anything at all, that we take the closest one and we add it to our aggro list. 
and try to attack immediately. This we, I, for, I had forgotten to do this for a while. What would happen is it would pull aggro, and then it would have to wait one more turn before it actually attacked. And that would that would cause a true return right away. I don't think this actually ever returns false at this point, right? Because if if we aggroed them, that means they're close enough. So, oh wait a minute, no. They might not be adjacent, so we might try to uh, try to see if we can attack, and we can't because they're too far away. Yeah. So in the test, I'll need to have to cover these two paths, right? And some of these two. But these two paths would be, we've aggroed someone and they're too far away, or we've aggroed something and they're right next to us, expect an attack. All right, let me start enumerating these. Um, act arrange, I get, uh, act assert for now. Thank you for that follow. I appreciate it. Hope you're enjoying the stream. Going from the top, where are all the returns? Here's the return here. This is returning if we are able to attack someone. So already have aggro able to attack an enemy. And then uh, the next return will be here where we are um, tether is a yoinking. Yes, that is a verb. Well, actually, I don't know if it is. Is yoinking the NPC back to the home position. That's this path here. Thank you for that other follow. I appreciate it. Trick or treat. You got to ring my doorbell, 715209. Then you get some candy. That's the other thing about trick or treating. Where I live, you have to be ready with the candy to hand out before the sun goes down because all the young kids, all the, like, the toddlers and stuff, the parents are always spooked about having them run around it in the dark and so they'll all start trick-or-treating like while it's still light outside what's the command to ring my doorbell there's no command you have to actually physically be at my door and ring it to get candy that's the requirement sorry <laughs> yoinking as in snatching you use that as a verb all the time it, it seemed to fit right sorry ts chost uh i would be giving you a stickers bar if i could that's one of the many candy bars we have, I have. Okay, next return path. You got a lot of candy. Glad there's no trick-or-treating here. <laughs> it's all for you, huh? Sounds like a dangerous thing to ask my Twitch chat. What? It's, well, trick-or-treating. Well, okay. Maybe I shouldn't, but okay. <laughs> Maybe you're right to lose. <laughs> um, what was I, what was I going to say? Oh, one bad thing about trick or treating is the day after, um, the candy you you have left over, you got to do something with it. So it used to be uh, when I had my last job, is you go into the office the next day and everyone will be bringing in all their extra candy, and you would just be tempted the whole day to eat junk food at work. <laughs> the dentist will be happy. Yeah, it's it's all it's all a conspiracy to. Um, get more patience in, right? Okay, if you don't have aggro, get pulled. So, there are two paths through this. You can get pulled and not a, and not successfully attack or successfully attack. So, um no aggro yet, not being tethered or not not being yoinked by the tether. Found a new an aggro. New enemy added to ag aggro list. Able to attack them. And then the all other alternative is not able to attack them. Actually, if they're not able to attack and they'll continue on, right? What would it do? It would be pursuit, right? try to pursue them and okay so not able to attack them pursue pursue them I think the only I don't think it's possible to get aggro can't attack can't pursue and drop immediately right let me double check what pursuit try entity does 
to make sure I understand that. All right, it was here. It's we try to go to their position. Right, they won't be gone. They won't be in a different zone. They won't be out of aggro range. Oh, oh, if they can't move to them. Does that really happen? If they're blocked, they drop aggro immediately? I guess so. So that might happen. So let's put a case for that. Able to pursue them. And the other one is not able to pursue them. Okay. So another another case was um, n no enemy ag no enemy added n no new enemies and if we have no new enemies it's the same thing there might be well let's not cover all these cases again let's cover the case where there are no enemies no enemies in range that would be um just this one no no action taken no action should be taken what am i coding i'm coding this uh, game that i've been building for the last year kind of looks like this and specifically right now the part of the game that controls what george is doing it's called the npc ai script you see how he's kind of trying to get to that slime whenever the slime moves he moves to match it he's in pursuit of that slime right now and um, if, oh, and I had to pick up the slime, not him. If I put the slime, oh no, pick up the slime. There we go. If I put the slime within range, he goes and destroys it, right? And now he's just kind of patrolling around. If I put a new slime nearby, he will go and engage and kill it. So the part of the script that causes him to go pursue and destroy it, I'm calling the aggression subscript or piece of the script. And before today, it didn't have any kind of testing to make sure it worked properly. So I was essentially just doing like print statements and uh, hoping that it worked and see if it worked. And I eventually got it to work, but it was just a painful process because there are lots of bugs. So I'm trying to prove that today and all the last week up until today by writing script tests. That's what I'm doing today. Hey, there's A squared. So yeah, if you want to know anything more specific, you can check my notebook or ask me questions. The game is online now. It's multiplayer, so that means you play it through the web browser, but the actual the game is running in a backhand server, and there's a connection between the game in the browser, which I call the front end, and the actual game logic, which is the back end. It's using WebSockets with SSL for security. And there's lots of moving pieces and lots of parts you may or may not be interested in. Feel free to ask me about any part. The game is inspired by Ultima 4, Ultima 5. So those are old retro kind of games. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, where did that go? It disappeared. Okay, someone put a message on deck and then it disappeared. Anyway. <laughs> uh, I should probably put the original comment on deck. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's the original question from Mortem. By the way, if you're wondering what that thing, what that overlay is, it's called featured.chat that we're using to kind of highlight questions from viewers and give context. So I'm describing, what am I coding? Coding my game. Uh, so the game's inspired by Ultima 4, Ultima 5, so it's kind of like a 2D tiled RPG. Uh, the artwork is minimal because I'm not that great of an artist. I, don't, I wouldn't say I'm an artist at all. I'm uh, mostly focusing on getting an engine up and running, and I'm not using an existing engine because I enjoy making stuff from scratch. So you'll see me, um, instead of taking an existing library or a game engine like Unity, I'm making my own thing. Kind of like what Homemade Hero does, only I'm not nearly as far along as he is. That kind of thing. So that's what I'm doing. Please feel free to ask any more specific questions that you'd like. You hate how to try, even trying to select a message puts it on deck? Yeah, well, that's okay. It can stay on deck. I can just take it off of the deck if I want. The on deck we're talking about is this uh, featured.chat, which is that. And if you're a streamer, you can try it out for your stream. It essentially lets me or anyone I delegate 
pick out messages from chat and make them highlight on an overlay over there. And it's got its own like little user interface. It was sort of commissioned by Twitch, still a work in progress. And another streamer that I know is uh, actively working on the development of it. You're trying to copy paste a link in it and it went, hey, you want this? Okay. <laughs> I see what happened. Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. So what I'm working on specifically now is the script that George uses when um, he gets aggressive and tries to pursue and fight enemies. Here are some different scenarios that might happen that we want to test. If we already have aggro and able to attack an enemy, attack them. In other cases, the tether is yoinking them back to the home position. So if George is pursuing an enemy and gets too far out here, George will, will be pulled back much like a guard dog chain to a dog house would, would be yoinked back suddenly. And Rokal Thrick, how you doing? So that's scenario two. Scenario three is we don't have any aggro yet. We're not being yoinked back by the tether, but a new enemy has been aggro added to the aggro list and we are able to attack them. Uh, put on a new, was a new enemy added? When does, when does that happen again? Oh, this is pull aggro. Let's say new enemy in range. Let's do it. Let's say that. Put on aggro list and, and attack. New enemy in range, not able to attack them, but able to pursue them. Add to aggro list and pursue. No aggro yet, not being yoked for the tether. New enemy in range, not able to attack them, not able to pursue them. I think what it does is it adds and then removes them from the aggro table, right? It calls pull aggro and immediately it calls drop aggro. Add, but then immediately remove target from aggro list. And then finally, no aggro yet, not being yoinked, no enemies in range, no action. Hey there, Phantasmix. How are you doing? Okay, so I've enumerated all the different scenarios that this NPC aggression script will, will have to deal with. They are essentially, every time we return, we have finished one pathway through the code, and so roughly speaking, each one of these is one path through this script. So I need to set up the, or arrange the um, inputs. So the inputs are in the form of this context list or table. And just borrowing from the previous test, this stuff. Actually, let me borrow with the comment there. We'll have NPC Delta. We have an NPC. What do we use from the NPC? We use aggro. So I think we have more than one thing too. So what will, aggro will be initially empty. What else do I need from NPC? Is it, oh, aggro range. We need that. I don't know. What do we want it to set it to? Let's set it to something small like five. What else do we need from NPC? Nothing? Nope, nothing else. Okay. I need enemies. That's supposed to just be a list. NPC delta entity position, and then we need a, instead of time, we have a tether. And what is tether? Actually, we don't need it. This is not needed at all. I think it used to be needed, but then we delegated it to that, and it picks it from the context directly. So we actually don't need tether. So I'm going to leave it out. In fact, should I just, I should just remove it from there. I don't need it. There we go. And then, so if we already have aggro, I should, let, hold on. Before I do that, let me preemptively set this up. This is just too convenient not to put in now. Something that we call every test to reset the test. So for example, I'll probably want to reset the enemies because we may or may not have any enemies, right? So test context dot 
enemies is empty every time. Oh wait, why did I, why did I s mess with that? I shouldn't have. Does this thing need deltas? Don't think so. I can get rid of this deltas thing. That's also not needed. So I can just do this. Reset the enemies. Um, what else? Oh, the enemy, ag the aggro table. Let's just make a new NPC table every time. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to remove... Um, remove the, all of the ones that I'm going to reset anyway. And just call reset test first. That would be better, right? Reset test at the front. Click, click, paste, done. I love multiple cursors. And then we're going to call the thing, and it's going to return something. Uh, let's, yeah, let's just copy a line from here. Where am I? I need to go back to there. There we go. And we're going to call NPC aggression. And these are all going to be true, right? Every time we do something, we're returning true. So true, true. The only time I return false is if we don't actually do anything. So all of them will return true except for the very last one. The reason why they return true or false is um, it's meant to be used in a higher level AI script where if NPC aggression made a decision and did something, we basically stop the higher level script. But if it returns false, that means we decided not to do anything in an aggression script. So then the higher order script could say, okay, we tried aggression. It didn't, we didn't do anything, so let's try something else like Wander, which is, I think, exactly what I do in the real game. So, like, a true means stop work for this turn, for that NPC, because they did something. All right, so this first one is where we have something on the aggro table. So I need to put something in the aggro table. NPC, uh, test. Oh, this is wrong, isn't it? This should be that. I already waved to you, 715209. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> you know who I didn't wave to was Mordem, who asked what I was doing. Hi. And Toulouse. Hi, Toulouse. All right. Test context.mpc.agro equals. Now, what does enemies actually need to, or aggro have to have in it? It's just a target entity, so I can put whatever I want. Um, test enemy. No details are needed even, right? Yeah, so I just make it enemy. I just need to define that somewhere. Let me be consistent, because it's an entity. I'll have entity in the name. 85, there we go. You fell asleep? Well, good morning. Again, 715209. Too many meetings. That's... Hope they're productive meetings, Toulouse. That's either good or bad, I guess. Well, you're saying too many meetings. That implies that it's bad. You didn't say a lot of meetings or just enough meetings or not enough meetings. <laughs> Almost never productive meetings. Ooh, that feels bad, man. Feels unproductive, man, really. Okay, able to attack means it called something. Right, NPC attack, so we need to stub that out. Actually, in order to make this easier on me, I'm going to actually make the name say so. Test enemy in range. Well, test enemy in range entity. Enemy in range entity. Sort of a weird name. So we need to mock NPC attack, right? Context and so we'll um expect or hmm. actually let me let me do a, a technique here where we say local um 
was it called results? I call it results. Like attack is one possible result. No, I didn't call it results. What did I call it? One of these tests will illustrate. I just need to find which one it was. I can't remember which one it was. Maybe drop loot. Ooh. It's entities created. Not quite. Combat? Updates. Updates? Ah, uh, I guess. Updates. And then this will just add to it. And then it would be type equals attack. And we'll just have this also do this. We'll have moon unit expect equal test context context. And then we'll also expect that the um the context dot uh where am I? I'm uh, I'm looking for this one. Target entity, because we will we'll want to check that that's done. That target entity is set up to be the test enemy in range. And then we'll expect an attack. Type equals attack for updates. And then we'll want reset test to reset the update. So that means I'll want this up front, right? But let me move reset test to the end and we'll say updates is a new table every time. Hey there, Red Sky One. It's going okay. I've got one out of five tasks done today. Got five more um, aspects of the AI script to break up and make tests for. So I did wander and now I'm on aggression right now. So this is the script that's run to pursue enemies, pull and drop aggro. So this test scenario where we have aggro and we're able to attack the enemy we expect an attack to happen. So one thing I'm trying to do as I write these unit tests with the comments and also the way I format this stuff is to make it sort of document what we expect the aggression script to do in different situations. This is saying in this situation, the NPC has something in its aggro list. It's an enemy within range. When we call it, we expect it to attack. And I want to make it pretty much readable without knowing the in the details of the internals of this function it's sort of documenting if in this situation this is what we expect to happen you just show us our pumpkin carvings i do <laughs> i might put it in the discord later i'd have to physically get up and go take a picture of it i can do that though if you really want i'll, I'll take pictures and put them in my discord my daughter's really good, a really good artist, and so she made an amazing pumpkin carving. Actually, I have it in my phone right now. I'll get her permission to post it, and then I'll, if she gives me her, the permission, I'll post it later. I can't do that. Sorry, T.S. Jost. <laughs> Promise, if I can, if I get the go-ahead, I'll put the pictures in uh, Discord later. All right. Yeah, I mean... She doesn't want it to be posted online. It would be mean of me to just do it behind her back. Okay, do I expect anything else on attack? Yeah, because I didn't personally carve any pumpkins, so I don't own any of the carvings, technically. Actually, if that is called, that's the only thing we expect, so we're done with that scenario. Okay, so the next scenario is yoinking. So yoinking would be that tether gets called so let's simulate a tether that should not be there and it should not be local actually function context I can spell correctly today uh, technically I didn't pay for the pumpkins either my son did actually I don't know if he paid it with his money or ours I think he bought them, though. Yeah. 
That's one kind of cool side effect when your kids get older and they're like 15, 16, 17, is that now they can buy stuff for you sometimes. So I think he bought the pumpkins this year. Pretty cool, huh? He's got his own money and everything. It's growing up. He's growing up already. It's going to be in, out of the nest soon. <laughs> okay, NBC Tether. At least I want to do the update thing. And they expect the context is correct. Is that it? Yes. And so this should be Tether. And really, it's what does it return, right? Um, oh, NPC attack has to return something, too. This should say, if... Oh, right. Let's put the um, target in here. And then, because it could be an enemy out of range, instead of doing an expect, we'll say if the entity, target entity, is the one in range, then return, well, we'd say return that, right? True if it's the enemy within range. Let me make an enemy not in range. Not in range. So we'll have this target thing um, here, and we'll expect that there. There we go. Cool. So, tether. I think I just have to set up, do, what does tether return? NPC, tether return. And let's uh, let's reset that every test reset, and we'll just return that. Then here we want it to return true. So expect true, and then we'll expect a a tether is called instead of attack. All right. Cool. So that's two down. So next. new enemy in range so we need to put something in the enemies list that um when manhattan distance is called oh wait a minute enemy info okay it can't just be a number it has to be a table with entity and pause in it and the position has to have um a z coordinate also okay it's a bunch of stuff i have to do here also the position from the context has to have a Z coordinate in it too. Uh, Z equals 17, I guess. I know, they grow up so fast. Woo -hoo -hoo. Hey there, Hulk DX. All right, so that enemy. Where is enemy set up? Right there, okay. So to put an enemy in range would be to put something here, right? And that's a list and then an element will have an NPC entity and they have to be in range. Well, in, let's, let's change this name. In attack range. And not in attack range and then um, let's make another one in aggro range and then maybe yet another one not in aggro range so, like, this is right next to it. This is not next to it, but still within aggro range. I guess, actually, I guess these would fold together. Yeah, let's have... have the same entity for both. So, within attack range, within aggro range, and, and not even within aggro range. There we go. Oh, thank you, Hulk. That intro video is really old, too. I need to make a new intro video. There are some... 
more recent videos for the recap series, but even that, I kind of am slipping. I haven't made recap videos for like the last couple months. So those give a more current introduction, like the very first intro video, it was before I even started working on the game I'm doing. Those recap ones are showing like more recently start the starting of the working on the game, but yeah, I have to I have to catch those up. Can't believe you followed in May. Time flies so fast. I can't believe I started this like a year ago. <laughs> Time flies so fast, you know. Okay. Yeah, so Hulk, if you have any questions, let me know. But uh there will be a lot of differences between the intro video and now because I have this game I'm working on and I'm a year into it, so the game incorporates all of the stuff that I talked about in the intro video and all the uh, pieces like web server, web socket stuff I've been doing and the fact that I'm doing it on stream. But yeah, there's a whole lot of new stuff now. Not everything is in that video and I haven't updated it yet. Okay, this needed to be able to attack them. So it should be the one in attack range, right? It's a long name. Hey there, Mr. Love Pickle. How are you today? Okay, so that means Manhattan distance, we should, um, I mean, I may actually have to have a position. Yep. Let's put them in range. So if that's at 2, 4, 17, we'll put it right next to him. 3, 4, 17. There we go. So using Google Test for CPP? Yeah. So these are all... Uh, some examples of some tests using Google tests, right? Uh, I don't know if the intro video covered it or not, but I'm using two extensions to VS Code to make it easier. So the top level one, so to speak, is this Test Explorer UI. It adds this little test beaker thing, which gives you a list of all your tests. And then along with that, I use this Catch2 in Google Test Explorer. And that connects between this Test Explorer UI and the actual tests themselves. So it knows how to find them. And then when you click um, go to test or run or debug, it knows how to run them and stuff. And then recently, in addition to this, was I made a little program called Moon Unit, which impersonates Google Test. And instead of running C++ tests, it runs Lua tests. <laughs> Yeah, all because I'm really trying hard last year and this year to adopt this test-driven development approach. And I failed to do this at first with the Lua scripts, and I'm paying for it now by catching up and writing scripts for, fun, for, for scripts I already have. How's it been going for me? Really well when you think about how many bugs, more bugs I could have had, I think. I think it's prevented a lot of bugs from happening. And when I've had bugs, it's helped me find them more quickly because usually a, a unit test will break. And even if the unit test doesn't break, just the penalty that I, have, uh, that I enforce on myself of if a bug s slips through the test framework, I have to go back and write a test to uh, demonstrate the bug and then fix the test, or fix the bug in order to make the test run. I think it's a, for me, it's been a, a, a good way to discipline myself to write code better. But it's not for everybody. And sometimes I'll kind of like cut the corners or say, ah, oh, it's not worth it to write a unit test for this. Let me just fix it. Like if it's a single line of code, it's like if the bug here was that this needed to be a two and not a three, I'm not going to go out and write a unit test to make sure that that's supposed to be a two and, and, and you know, I, I do keep in mind the cost of doing tests is make sure that at least in my mind it's less than the costs I would incur by not having a test later and that could be more long term so some, sometimes it's hard to judge more like a feeling and try to err towards the side of writing a test if I'm not sure if I need it um, as long as it's if I know it's not too costly alright 
We're in the middle of this, right? There's an enemy in there within range. What else do we need? Does the script need to know? Manhattan distance. I think I'm just going to pull that in exactly. Like a copy of, of this. Since it's such a little function, we'll just pull it straight in. Like that. And then what else? Uh, we're looking at the wrong thing. It's going to call pull aggro, so let's um, mock that. Equals function. End. Let's do... Um, we can do some expects and then an update. We'll end up call we'll say pull aggro at target equals target entity. So the NPC should be the NPC in our test context. Also the NPC entity should match as well. Uh, where's our context? Context, context, context. Where, oh, here it is. Yeah, that. So, and we don't return anything, right? Oh, we do return something. It's a... Really? What does it return? The new aggro list. Okay. And it's returning at Y. Oh, I think we're just using it locally. Yeah, we're using it locally to see if we can if we should try to pursue or or attack. Actually, it's it's exactly for this reason to pursue them if we couldn't attack them right away. Is this a hobby project? It started out as a hobby project years ago, but when I um left my last job and trying to figure out what I was going to do next, I thought now is a good opportunity to leverage some of the savings that I've been building up over the years and try to turn the hobby project into something that I can actually finish. And so I decided to form a company and make this my my own full-time job, so to speak, to actually get this done. So it's sort of like a life goal. Best case would be not only do I complete what's been a hobby project of mine for years, but I make it financially support me. That's the dream, that I can make something that other people want to play enough that they they would at least pay a living wage for me very 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 slim probability of that happening but minimum i want to i want to finish this project that I, it's been so long that i wanted to do it even if i it doesn't support me i'll still finish it it just might be that i might have to find some other job when my savings gets low but we'll we'll find we'll figure that out <laughs> so yeah it, it goes back to the code journey stuff in there and it talk that talks about how I've always kind of wanted to make this kind of a game and what it's what's inspired me to become a programmer in the first place so okay okay what am I doing it's gonna call NPC no it's gonna call Manhattan distance it's gonna call pull aggro. We have to return an array of the new aggro list. So I need to do that here. So I guess we'll just keep it simple. We'll return the a new table. Um I kind of want to take the existing aggro table, if there is one, which isn't even shown there. It's down here. And make a copy of it and add to, add to it. When do you think you'll finish it? Probably next year, a year from now. If it is successful, then I'll probably never finish it. I'll just keep extending it, kind of like other games out there that never end. You just come out with new content updates because... I think that would probably be the only way that I can make it financially successful is if um you never run you never run out of things to do in the game. I just constantly add to it. And um so the game would never f be finished, but maybe the engine part would be next year, the constant beta. No, it's more like ex constant train of extensions or expansions is what I hope to do. 
Now that said, I don't I don't know what's going to happen. I'm am I, I'm shooting for to try to get it to where I'm doing content as soon as I can, but realistically, not for another year or so. Will it be like finished as in people will maybe want to pay for it? <laughs> Until then, it's going to be free. Don't forget the skins and online mall. <laughs> yeah. I think what I want to do is make um new aggro local and then for um i dot v in i pairs test context dot aggro npc aggro do new aggro i equals v just to get a deep copy of it, and then we're going to add to the end equals target entity, and then return that. You joke, but he has said he wanted skins to be in exchange for points. Yeah? So, when you say skins, do you mean skins for the entire user interface or just your own character? Because if it's just your own character, sure, you can be whatever icons we come up with. <laughs> you could be the green guard, the one with green sleeves instead of red, and then um, that'll be like a like you know a nano transaction of some kind. <laughs> we'll make nano transactions a reality because they're they're the you know micro transactions. So last year, we're on to nano transactions now. Okay. Hmm. Enemies are on the list. We're going to expect pull aggro. And we're going to expect an attack too, right? Attack. Checks to see if it's within range. Right, so we'll expect an attack on that enemy. So this line too. Pull aggro. Pull aggro had a target in it as well. So same target. All right. We do things on the order of pennies now. Maybe. Those points will be pennies. I don't know. No aggro yet, not being yoinked, new enemy range, not able to attack them, but able to pursue them. So that's slightly different. Um, we'll put them further away. And it's within aggro range, right? We'll just be a pull aggro, and this, instead of an attack, it's going to be something else. And this is going to be that. So a tackle return falls. So it won't return. Instead, it'll go through that list and then call this one instead. And then we're going to mock that one. That is a function that takes a context. So we can expect the same context. Actually, I'm just going to copy all of that. Expect the same context we're going to call pursue. Target equals, or I do target equals this one. Context target entity. And then we can also expect limited is true. It's a limited pursuit, so it's tethered. Moon unit expect equal, or expect true, right? Yeah, true. For test, for context dot limited. And then we should return um, whether or not um, that entity is the one that's in aggro range or not. Actually, let's say, return that it's not the one outside of aggro range. Like that. Okay, so we'll add a pursue here. No aggro yet, new enemy in range, not able to attack them, and not able to pursue them. Oh, I should have... um then it has to be within aggro range, but not pursuit range. Oh, I know what I, I know what to do. New enemy in range will just tweak the position. 
So we'll make it look like they're within aggro range, but then when they try to pursue, it will fail. And so we'll use the one that's not in aggro range anymore. So then we should get a drop aggro, right? Actually, not only will we get a drop aggro, but we might try to pursue the next enemy. Interesting. What happens if there's multiple things in the aggro table? It won't try to attack the next enemy. It will just try to pursue them. I wonder if that's a bug. Like, let's say the first one, it says, can't attack. So we get down to he here, and it's like, try to pursue, can't pursue. So drop aggro. Then loop back. Oh, there's someone else in our aggro table. Maybe we could have attacked them, but instead we try to pursue them. We can't pursue them because we're right next to them. So it would drop aggro. And then they would pull aggro the very next turn because they're right next to them and then immediately attack. So you'd, have, you'd be able to avoid an attack for one turn that way. Just by being second in the aggro table. Do I make a test scenario for that or do I just move on? Maybe. Let's maybe do that. Hmm. This is no aggro yet, though. I'd have to make another one where there's aggro. I'll do it later. How old am I? I'm in my 40s. I don't like to give up my exact age. Can't you tell with the gray hair and my beard? Actually, I guess you can't. Some people get, start getting gray in their 30s. You can kind of figure, work out the fact that I'm older because the code journey thing talks about um, that I worked that my last job so long and that the games I was inspired by when I was growing up were Ultima 4 and 5 and you can just look up when those games came out and then if I was a kid when those games came out then you have a rough idea of how old I was that's probably where I'll leave it <laughs> so drop aggro gets a bunch of stuff did I play Ultima Online? No, but my one of my friends did. He was way into it. He, I think he even, um, like, was one of those people who would buy a house and stock it up with stuff, and then you'd have to defend it because other people go in and loot your house or something like that. But then I might be getting it confused. He also played, uh, was it Star the Star Wars Online RPG? Where, the first one where, um, there's the hidden, broken Jedi class. Oh, it says... Didn't it say in that code journey? I worked at Qualcomm. Yeah, Qualcomm in San Diego. Drop aggro, I need that. Let's put it next to pull aggro. NPC. So this will be an entity number. And then a delta. Okay, fine. And then, so we can expect this again. And I assume that I'll just want to add this as is. Drop aggro. And tar leave the target there. And then put the delta. Wait a minute. No, I can just... Ex that's a side effect, right? Yeah. Hey there, Piano Boxer. Star Wars Galaxies, that's right. That's what it was. Yeah, it is correct. Marlou. And yeah, hi, Piano Boxer. So it's not pursue, it's... Uh, no, it is pursue. Uh, that was correct then. Oh, I need to... Does this drop aggro return something? Thank you for the follow, by the way. 
It does not return anything. So we're good. I just need to add this to the expectation in this step. Oh, thank you for that other follow. Put an aggro list in an attack. Able to pursue them. Cantress. Okay, so I already had that. Actually, that's all I needed, right? Target equals. Target equals. Okay, good. No aggregate, not being yoked, no enemies in range. So just pursue and there's nothing? That's what the first test did, right? No, the first test had something in aggro. So let's just do this. Should be no updates. I don't even know why I copied that. This will just be an empty list. No updates at all. Do I want to check the NPC delta? Oh, this is expected to fill in that, so... Okay. We need to just expect that that's what, what it is. That NPC delta is the one from our context. Yeah. I think that's it. Ready to run this test. Let's do it. Uh, wrong one. That one. Nope. I didn't compile because I have an unexpected symbol near the equals sign on line 63. That's because I don't have a comma. Try again. This time, still. Wait a minute. Did it run it? It's still an unexpected symbol. I'm, there's something else I'm missing here. Oh, comma up here, and up here. Weird that it got to line 63. 58. Oh, I can't do... Okay, these aren't commas. I thought that this was a table, but it's not. That should fix it, right? Cool. So it compi it um parsed it, and now it's able to run the test. Think you need to switch to being a dentist instead of a programmer? Six hundred fifty dollars for an hour of work today? Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> is that just the work, or is that also the um, materials? Like, did you get six hundred and fifty dollars of gold put in your mouth, right? Or is it just his time? That's like how much a lawyer, a good lawyer, will be paid too, right? Six hundred fifty dollars an hour. Okay, so actual value missing key target. So that means there's no target in the ta in this table table this table. So pull aggro had no target. Probably because it's not pull aggro. So let me um copy that line and take this out to see what the type is. This is just a shortcoming of moon unit. It's tether. So it got tethered. Oh, right. We do check the tether, but tether will return false. Okay, so um, it will pull aggro, but before that, we'll, it will call tether. All of these will call tether then. They'll all call tether first. Run again. Expected pursue actual attack on 122. Did attack... Oh, right. It'll call attack, but then attack will fail, right? I think we always try to attack, but it will fail. So, right. So, attack all checks its side effects, right? So, I don't I can just say we tried to attack, then we tried to pursue, and then it failed. Right. You play Star Wars Galaxies? Nice. Do you have a video of the architecture for your project? Uh, I need to make one. <laughs> Let me give you a point for asking for it. The closest would be the notes that I have. So these notes, if you go to uh, notes, there's this realm server architecture. And combine that with the entity component system to explain what's going, what's the separation within this block here. 
And this is the architecture for the back end server. The front end of the game, I don't have uh, any architecture drawings right now. But yeah, the when I mention things like entity component system or ECS, that's this part of the server. And then in previous streams, not so much these days, but previous streams, I would talk about either coordinator or executor. Those are different pieces. Uh, coordinator, like this says, it's in charge of passing messages between different servers and clients and um, taking, it's basically the messenger. Executor is the one that takes commands to change the game that have been replicated across the cluster and actually applies them. So it changes the ECS or the player base or the configuration so that in the entity component system, we don't change it or anything else directly. We always feed back to the coordinator to replicate the request. Requ request once replicated, be it gets added to this journal, which is um, maintained by the uh, consensus algorithm. And then the executor reads from that to make the changes applied once they are confirmed, replicated across the cluster. It gets, co it, it gets uh, complicated when you need changes to to fan out to all the servers in a cluster when you have a multi-cluster arrangement or multi-server arrangement. I have multi-server, so the backend is actually three different servers and only one of them is actually running the ECS. The others are replicating the entire state so that if I, if I were to kill server one, either two or three would pick up from where server one left off and it would become the new leader of the cluster. And, um, yeah, it's magic. There you go. TLDR, magic. I like that E squared. It should include that in some of my commands. How does the raft consensus work? Magic. <laughs> Who is that George dude? He is a prototype NPC designed to introduce some of the concepts of the game. You'll kind of appear in this dungeon when you first start the game. And he's supposed to come up and approach you and talk to you and eventually lead you out of the dungeon and in, introducing some of the concepts in the game like combat, items, movement, lighting, stuff like that as he's going. So he's very early, rough around the edges right now. He gets stuck trying to get to the slime that you can't reach. Even if you ask him for help, he'll say, oh, okay, I'll lead you out. And then he just stands there because he's trying to kill these enemies. So I'm working on him still. He uh, is a key figure right now, but I don't know about permanent Flamehead. Maybe he will we'll retire him to some kind of nostalgic area of the game you can visit later. Is he your new best friend? Oh, hi there, Fargo Bitwise. <laughs> permanent key figure. Uh, you know, the longer he's in here, the more people will like him, and he'll be like a, a more of a permanent feature, I guess. Okay. One forty two is how we far we got. So that should have returned true and it returned false instead. So it chose not to aggro this enemy for some reason. Why not? Yeah, default zone's gone. I could bring it back, though, later. I have, like, old snapshots of the game state, and I could, like, resurrect the default zone. That might be a fun side project. Python script that reads the old game snapshot, pulls out all the tiles from the default zone, and adds it as a new numbered zone somewhere. Hey there, Almighty Games Dev. How are you doing? You guys should check out Almighty Games Dev. He actually makes and publishes games, which is something I haven't done yet, is publish a game. He's got several games on Steam. You might want to check out. Happy Halloween, yeah. So, and he also streams game dev. So you should check out his channel sometime. Need a rook guard. I don't know what a rook guard is, but okay. All right. I'm trying to figure out why this test case is failing. It's not actually going into here is it actually it would say what it's doing three target oh is it returning false but still pulling aggro because it can't attack i wonder if that's why 
Do I have a return false pet? Ooh, I do. It'll get all the way down to here, drop aggro, and return false. Because why? Because the... Ooh, is that a bug? Would he actually do two actions then? Because the pursue would actually... No. Not able to pursue, right? Not able to pursue, so it wouldn't make a turn. So this would be a false then. Oops, I hit the wrong button there. I did not mean to debug. Run it. Okay. The target is the wrong target. Oh, because I have this wrong. It That should go there. Okay, got past that test case and got down to here. So it had an extra key. So it did something. What did it do? Uh, what would it do if there are no enemies and nothing to aggro? It would pass that by... Oh, it would call tether, right. It's always going to call tether. Oh, I hear a scritch, scratch, scritch, scratch on my um, back door. You know what that is. It's a scary beast. I'll have to go get the scary beast and let it in. Uh, hold on. Let me get back. Let me, I'll be right back while I get the scary beast, okay? The beast. Yeah, hold on. It's Halloween, and you know what that means. Scary monsters roaming and looting and pillaging. And, oh my goodness, it's coming right for us. Get it. <laughs> Look at the camera. Come on. Look at the camera and purr. No, he doesn't care. He does not care. He's like, you let me in, let me down now. <laughs> he has massive half centimeter fangs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no FK is given. He, he already left the room. I don't know what he's doing. You thought it would be a rabbit? Yeah, that would make sense with my uh, stream avatar, but nope, he's a kitty. He is my beast. You have extended your use, let me go. Exactly, he's like, peasant, you have done your duty, now you are um, impertinent, let me down. Kita, exactly. Okay, 221. Oh, this is old code. Uh, right, let's just drop it. Yay, and it works. Hold on, what's this other stuff? Oh, yeah, we don't need this. Drop this too. It's old copy-pasted code. Cool, so it ran through all these different scenarios. Um, I wanted to add one where we have two things in the aggro list, but we can't pursue the top one. So like this, but slightly different. Uh, how do we word this? Already have aggro? Unable to attack enemy or pursue them. That's what I'm going to say. Already have aggro, but unable to attack or pursue. Also, another enemy is in range. Drop aggro from old target and pull aggro on... New target. Pursue new target. There we go. How to in VS Code add a breakpoint inside a static library? Yeah, sure. Uh, there we go. So the way I would do it is just like anything. I go into my static library here. Click there. Done. The problem you might be running into is actually um, 
hitting that when you're running code. So there, it, the problem could be one of many different things. Your library source is not in the same project. It should doesn't need to be. Um, just open the source file for the static library and put a breakpoint. So what you need to have, though, is the symbols file that was built along with the static library. Um, usually it gets incorporated into the executable symbol table, too. Now, if you didn't have the source code for the static library, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, as, as long as you have the library source somewhere on your machine and you built it, then the symbols should have been pulled into your executable's symbol table. No, yeah, but even on Linux, it should work, right? The symbol table includes, like, the names of source files and paths to source files and all that. If it's set up right, then... Just telling VS Code, I want a breakpoint at this line in this file should be enough because there should be a symbol table entry corresponding to that to, to that file that has a function with code that matches that line. So it should just work. If it doesn't work, then you're, it's maybe the library was built without symbols or the symbols didn't get pulled into your um, into the executable. But I would say it should just work unless you didn't build the... If you didn't build the library yourself or you didn't have the source at all, it might be very difficult to get that to work. And the way you would tell, I guess, is when you run the debugger. Let's, let's run the debugger or JSON test, for example. And that's not working. Now it's working. Ah, uh, hold on. Um, go back to that and go to a test. Put a breakpoint there and go. Ah, uh, one way you can tell that the debug the debug breakpoints won't work is if you if you manage to get into the debugger like this, and you go to a file and if if it tells you that it it can't break there for some reason, um, like. Let's let me think about this. I'll I'll take a completely unrelated piece of code that's not pulled in at all, right? And just put a random breakpoint there. See how it says unverified breakpoint? That's a sign that you don't have it in your symbol table. No symbols have been loaded for this document, it will say. If you're seeing that, no symbols have been loaded for this document, then you're missing the symbols, and there's not much you can do in VS Code. It has to it has to be in the symbol table ultimately. And if it's in the symbol table, VS Code ought to be able to add, put two and two together. That's the if if it should be in the symbol table and it's not, you're gonna have to start looking into your symbol table to see what's going on. I know how to do it in Visual Studio, but I don't know how to do it in Linux. On Visual Studio, you would. Um, Look at the symbols. Have you ever done this? Well, I can do it right now. Uh, let's pick... Sure, we'll pick this one. And... Um, I haven't built this in a while. Let's pick something small to build. Uh, test, JSON test, sure. Let's just tell it to build this. I know the text is small, but we should be okay for the purposes of this demonstration. I'll just put a breakpoint there. It's still running CMake. Hopefully it doesn't break and builds the, the silly thing. Build, build, build. Oh, it's release with debug info. This might be interesting. Okay, sure. It wants to reload the thing. Build a... Oh, it moved my cursor on me. Dang it. Build. Okay, so... Uh, if I click that and do... Um, pro, uh, what is it? I have to do like... Um, set... Where is it? There's like a... Set a startup project and then debugger, right? 
it'll get to that breakpoint. And then what you what you can do to debug the symbol table is you go to debug windows symbols. Where is it? Or modules. Modules. And I would just pull that out and just look at it here. So this tells you um, what executable and what dynamically loaded libraries are on Linux. It would be .so's. You're going to have to find the Linux equivalent of this. I don't know how to do it in Linux. But any debugger worth its salt should be able to tell you what modules have been loaded, what the paths are, whether or not it has symbols. So I know the text is kind of small, but what it's saying is it has symbols for JSON test.exe. It does not have symbols for all of these libraries which are built either built into Windows or this one is the um, Visual C runtime library, right? So... Um, you would look at your executable, make sure you have symbols loaded. The executable is going to include the static library, hopefully. And I think in Linux, you can actually list all of the symbols that it knows about within an executable, and you can just see if it's if it's there or not. But um, yeah, I'm not so fluent in Linux symbol table debugging. I just I just note that in um, Windows, if I have trouble setting breakpoints, that's the first thing I look at is, uh, oh, how come I can't dock that right? I look at the sim the symbols, um, let's look over here. There. I look at the symbols um, view to see if the symbols are loaded correctly and then what the path is. With LDD, yeah, there you go. Oh, it seems to be working, I missed that. Didn't realize it would be that much, but it's just adding the absolute fa file pass. Yeah, that's... So if you move files around, it might... That that, that could break the debugger simply because the debugger can't find the source file. Um, so the solution for that is just rebuild all. <laughs> yeah, usually the debugger can find it if you just built it because the paths are in there. All right, back to... Close that. Back to the, no, close that to, back to this. So that's working, right? Oh no, I was in the middle of adding this extra one here. Already have aggro, but unable to attack or pursue. Also another enemies in range. Drop aggro from ultra aggro, pull aggro. So I need to have like two enemies. Or not. The enemies is checked only for pulling aggro, right? Enemies. Yeah, so this could be the new enemy in aggro range. But then I have to have something in the aggro table already. This thing. Mm, this one, right? It will say not in aggro range anymore. But there is one, so we would expect true. And it would um, do an attack test first, right? Yeah, so it'll do an attack on the one that's no longer in range. It'll do a tether call, and then it'll do a pull aggro on the, the one in range. And then try to, it, it won't do attack though, right? No, it will. It will try to attack. And then it will pursue, and then it'll drop the old one, right? Or will the drop go first? The drop will go last, actually. This is if we don't have aggro. Hold on a second. This is not quite true. It'll still pull aggro even if it's attacking something else. The Oryx plays, how are you doing? And Anakin Luke, how are you doing? Oh, and uh, Meme Clear Bombs, I forgot to wave to you. And Witmog, I also forgot to say hey. Hey Witmog, how are you doing? I missed your, your, your hello. Yeah, the highs, yeah, that's just something weird that I do. You will get waved at if you chat. It's just something, it's something you have to deal with. Just like 
if you are married and you have to deal with your mother-in-law's quirks. <laughs> if you watch my stream, you got to deal with my quirk of waving at you, I guess. All right. Get Paul. So this is not necessarily true, right? Because we'll also get there if we do have aggro, but we couldn't attack. So that returns false. So yeah, this should it should pull, attack the new one, then pursue because we couldn't attack, and then a drop aggro on the old one. Let's see if that works like I think it will. Nope. Didn't work. The target number is wrong. One, two, three, four. The pursue target is wrong. Oh, yeah. It'll pursue the first one first. Yep. And then drop aggro. And then pursue the other one. Right? Uh, down here. Yeah, pursue, drop, loop back up, pursue... Yeah, there we go. So, right, it'll attack the one. It'll try to attack. Couldn't. So, it checks the tether. It sees that there's a new enemy in range. We'll try to attack it. Couldn't. So, then it'll try to pursue the old one that it couldn't attack earlier. Couldn't pursue. So, it drops aggro. Then it'll pursue the new one. Got it. Have you ever used a ligature font? I'm using a ligature font now. Right? That's how I do that kind of stuff. Or are you talking to someone else? Yeah, I think it's cool. Uh, I have a font command. If you're interested, what I use, I use Fira Code. It's got the custom ligatures enabled with that setting in VS Code. I like that things like greater than or equal to are, um, it shows it in the mathematical symbol. Not equal to. How come it's not doing that right now? Oh, because it knows that it's Lua. I think if it was in C++, it would... Actually, why not... Why would it... Why would not equal to work? Not work. Is it? Is it really language sensitive? Like, if I made that not equal... Yeah, so... Interesting. Interesting it's sensitive to the language. Not equal to is the mathematical not equal, but in Lua, it doesn't work. So can I do a... Okay, that works. That's tilde, not, tilde equal. Why is not equal to not work there? Is it just the language? If I check, change that to C++, oh, look at that. It, it, the ligature is sensitive to the language. I didn't know that. That's cool. It's like, oh, you're in Lua, so I'm not going to make a custom ligature there. You want to make a language that requires using the actual Unicode characters? You mean that doesn't work? I don't see why you couldn't. You just have to add new symbols, t token symbols. It It is valid? Really? That's valid in C? I didn't know that. Is that a new operator that I don't know about? From like C11 or something? Why wouldn't it work on Lua? Because uh, Lua... That doesn't mean anything in Lua. In Lua, it's tilde equal for not equal. Lua is just weird that way. Lua also starts every array at index 1 instead of 0. <laughs> okay, I'm done with that script. So I'm done with two out of three of the things today. Next was guide. This was maybe a bigger one. I know blasphemy, yeah. Yeah, tilde equals is not equals in Lua. You got it. Now you know something in Lua, T.S. Just. Doesn't, doesn't Tim hate Lua? Or am I thinking of a different streamer? There's one streamer I watch who hates Lua, and I'm like, I'm like all Monka S whenever he talks about hating it. I'm like, ooh, don't tell him I use it. <laughs> Every, it's everything that's not C++. So he hates Python, too? Well, what's, what's there to hate about Python? It's such a lovable little language. 
Okay, next is guide.lua. So let me just take that and copy it and call it guide test. Change this to NPC guide. And I'm just going to wipe out the whole thing. That's our boilerplate. And then I'm going to make a new script called guide that has um, this stuff in it. So we're going to want the guide patrol, guide heuristic, guide find path, and guide. And why is this separate? Oh, probably because they're sorted alphabetically. But yeah, that too. Guide, guide, guide return. Wait a minute. Oh, the pathfinding should be separate. Okay, so not all of these functions. All right, new. F let's make the new script first. MPC guide dot lua. Then from here, obviously this one we want. So cut and paste that, and make that a function. Next. The heuristic, yes, we want that. Or do I want that to be generic? No, I think I want that to be specific for the guide script. So the heuristic is used with the A star algorithm to find a path, right? And every usage of the path finding algorithm can have a different heuristic. It's basically to make the path finding more efficient to find the path more quickly. So this one I wanted as a separate testable thing. Yes, I want that separate. But guide I want pulled into, and yeah, guide, guide, path, all this stuff. All of this gets pulled out and pasted here. You have to go now? Okay, see you, Whitmock. Am I doing trick-or-treating? No, I'll be at home handing out the candy today. My The rest of my family is doing the trick-or-treating. Someone's got to stay home and be the other end of the trick-or-treating. So the giving out of candy, that's me. Okay. This table is actually just used internally by something, right? Yeah, yeah, it's used by this. What if I make this its own function? So let's first define it here. We do some refactoring. MPC act guide state. And pull this out. Oh, wait a minute. Um, It's NPC. And then... And it needs the context too. Actually, and the NPC was in the context, right? Yeah, so it's just context. So that goes here, and then um, NPC is context NPC. Yep. And then that becomes this. And that's a good clean separation point because I can then take this and pull it out and place it here. And I just have to rename a few things. So if that's the function NPC act guide, then this thing is really a lookup table, right? NPC act guide dispatch. It's like a dispatch table. There we go. Eat all the candy. If I was younger, maybe I would try and I get super sick and I throw up and then I would stop re answering the doorbell ring because I'd be like catatonic on the ground in a pool of my own um, sick. But um, no, I'm old enough to not eat all the candy. <laughs> We've adapted that stupid Halloween thing here as well. Have all the lights turned off in the house so you don't get bothered. I mean, that's always an option. And that's what we teach our kids. If the lights are out, then you skip it. You only go to the houses that obviously are welcoming the trick-or-treaters. What really sucks is if you turn off the lights and people still ring the doorbell. Then it's like, arr, arr, arr. don't they get the protocol? Lights are out. We don't answer the door. <laughs> okay, that's a dispatch table. 
Yeah, angry old man. Get, you young kids, get off my lawn. <laughs> Come and roll as the door light is off. They're not doing anything? Yeah. Yeah. We turn off all the ex exterior lights to make sure that people know that, yeah, we're done. We, we usually wait until they've tapered off to nothing. And we don't get anyone for like an hour, and then we're like, okay, let's turn the light off now. These can all be local or... Actually, no, I want them to be testable, so I'm going to make them these ones functions. Yes, make them functions of the context. Function. Okay. I don't like this act guide. Maybe, maybe rename that. How, where does that show up here? Only in two places? Let's rename it. Let's call that um, NPC guide act. And then this we can rename. Put the act there. Or just dispatch would be fine, actually. Okay, let's take the act out of this one. Guide, guide. That's a horrible name. Um, what does this one essentially do? This one's like begin guiding or something. Act. This is NPC guide. NPC guide. Begin. Sure, we can call it begin. And then we'll call this one NPC guide return. Actually, I don't think return's the right, I don't think begin's the right one. It's, um, This is when we're actively guiding. So yeah, let's fix that. That should just be guide. Ah. Words. <laughs> when the guide is guiding, guide guiding? Kind of implies what it's doing. So either patrol or we're guiding or return. What if I make this more consistent and I say patrolling and this will be returning because that, that sort of is what I want to, I want to imply that it's an active thing we're doing more than once. We're either patrolling or we're guiding or we're returning. Those are the states we're in, right? I like that better, yeah. So act is like do something. What do we do? Well, we need to see what state we're in and dispatch to either we're patrolling, guiding, or returning. Yeah, I like it. And what is guide path? Oh, I see. That's like follow path. NPC guide follow follow path. I think this should be like start. Well, actually, this one is called from a dialogue, so I need to be careful about this one. If I rename it, yeah, let's keep it the way it is. If I rename it, I have to, I'd have to go into the dialogues that call it and then change it. Let's just leave it the way it is right now. You gotta yell, get off the lawn. What if I had like a remote controlled speaker that said, you damn kids, get off my lawn. <laughs> you think you were never was taught that non houses should be avoided? Oh. I see. Hmm. What happens if George is interrupted by a second player while guiding another? I think... Let's see what will happen. 
that he'll begin a new path from where he is to the exit, looks like. In fact, if he's on his return trip even and you interrupt him and you say, hey, I need help, he'll immediately guide you out. But what if he can't? Um, well, it just puts it in this path local variable, right? Yeah, so it'll do one of two things. Um, he'll either start pathing immediately from where he is to the exit, or he'll say, I can't help you, and then he'll do nothing. Yeah. Select by child, but target the parent. Can you do it, A squared, can you do it with a combination of selectors? It's under consideration for edge. Ooh. <laughs> under, consi under consideration. Considering it. <laughs> it's like we're at the mercy of some some um, strange uh, hidden uh, committee somewhere. I don't know if this is in the right order that I that I like. It's not. It's all over the place. Is it because I had? No, it's just completely out of whack. Let's put guide at the top. I don't need to say it's a global function. I'll say this is meant to be called from dialogues to trigger an NPC to start guiding a player. And then let me put patrolling down at the bottom. Next, like, let's have patrolling, guiding, and returning be in the right order here. Patrolling, guiding, returning. And then that goes with the dispatch table. And then this one is follow path, which is shared. Then this heuristic. Okay, that's that's a good order. Cool. So then the, the order that I want. So let's write some tests. So this first one will be NPC guide. There's a CSS4. I'm behind the times. Hmm. Isn't done yet, huh? Doesn't matter if some spec says something if no one, nothing implements it. Yeah, you have to look at can I use, right? That site, can I use? So they do research on this stuff works. In what versions? Okay, so this is going to call with components, and I have mocked that before. I'm going to mock it the same way. It's going to expect a certain thing. We're going to expect position NPC in caps to be asked for. And it expects us to call our visitor with that list of components. It's going to pull them out into a context and call that. So that's another thing we can mock. context so I can be sort of whimsical here and say visitor pause equals somewhere NPC equals someone caps equals yes <laughs> be whimsical here and um, so we can expect, we can do some expectations here somewhere. Actually, I'll just do it like this. Context. And just copy this. Actually, what if I um, in total, uh, what if I extract, extract that out? So local, um, Actually, I can't, because there's going to be more stuff in here, right? It also adds NPC entity. Okay, so never mind that. It's going to add NPC entity to be whatever I put into the guide thing. So let's make a one out here. Test NPC entity is 42. So that should be that. And then waypoint is guide. So expect that for context when that's called from this visitor. We give it that, just pass through. Is that what we expect? 
And then we're going to call it twice. One with a path and one without a path, right? Oh, wait a minute. No, um, it calls that. Right, so let's, let's have it. Let's say path found. And we'll just have it return that. And we'll have, um, so this is all a range. Act is um, we found we find a path to the ah uh, where do we where are we finding a path to the waypoint right find a path to the given find a path to the given waypoint we do not find a path. Actually, just say we find we find a path. We f we do not find a path. We find a path would be path found equals some list, right? It's gonna take that list and put it into an array and and add it to the NPC component. So it can be whatever I want. So foo equals bar, right? Why not? Just something in there. And this other one would be path found as empty list. So we'll have to mock game chat and modify component delta. So uh, where did I mix these? I want to use the mixed one. Is it deltas? No. I really don't want to type it again. I just want to copy it from somewhere. <laughs> Sure, I did this somewhere. Oh, here we go. There we go. Um, where are we? Down here. Put that there. So local updates. Actually, let's make updates something that we put here fresh. Okay, and then we need game chat. Game dot chat. There we go. Common mocks. And I totally put it in the wrong spot, didn't I? Put it in the wrong file. There it goes. Now, who are we chatting to when we chat? We're chatting to guided. Guided is something that's passed in. Okay, so local test player entity 41. Expect that. Yes. So we put into the message. So it's all about the calling the thing two different ways. And it does not return anything. So there's no r direct effects. It's all side effects, right? Moon unit expect. Why can't I type today? Why can't I type most days? So sloppy on the keyboard. Updates. The first time we will expect a path to be found. So it'll be a, a chat. What kind of keyboard do I use? Let's see, it's in my specs. Adesso AKB635UB, and it's just a random mechanical keyboard that I liked when I was looking at keyboards at Fry's Electronics. So it's not, it's not anything special, it was cheap. It's cheap and functional, felt nice, so that's what I got. I'm not too picky when it comes to uh, keyboards like I don't research to death and find the most expensive keyboard with all the, the lights on it <laughs> I do that for mice not keyboards <laughs> the mouse is that cool uh, G600 mouse when my first G600 died I bought another G600 I was very happy that they still made them 
so the game chat is hard coded right now. It's just this. How often do you use a number pad on the right side? When I play World of Warcraft, I use it all the time because I have hotkeys to do um, certain spells on there. When I'm programming, I never use it uh, because I have programmed so long without it that I just don't have the in the habit to use it. But yeah, it was really it comes in handy in some games where you have a lot of buttons, and World of Warcraft is one of those. A lot of buttons, and you don't want to be constantly reaching over to press them because you have to be quick to hit the 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 home keys, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, Adam though uses G six hundred two, and he I think he heavily connects it to auto hotkey to do stuff for his stream, to automate stuff. He's a lot. He's a lot, he's a lot more into um, OS efficiency than I am. Okay, there's a chat, and then there's a there's a modify entity, and we're modifying the. That's the wrong word, isn't it? It's test NPC entity. Oh, and this other one, the guided, is the player entity. So it's the uh, chat. We're already expecting the player to be the target, right? Oh, this should say type equals. This should say message equals. Entity here is the... Um, can I just expect that and drop this? I think I will. We're going to drop these two just to make it easier on me. We'll just expect something, some things here. Expect the test entity for the entity. Expect NPC for the component type. And then I just need to have delta. Delta equals what? State equals guide. Checkpoint is JSON nil. Guided is this guy. Path equals JSON array of that, of path found. Okay, and then we don't find a path. Then there is no modify. It's just a chat message saying, feels bad, man. Actually, he says, sorry, I don't know the way out. Then he says, feels bad, man. Cool. Let's just test that as is for now. Because, yeah, it's not going to work. I'll have to fix it first. I mean, what's the difference here? Oh. Expected he'll show the way out. Actual was, sorry, don't know the way out. Okay. Well, bummer. Why did he say that? We should have returned the path. Hmm. Yeah, feels bad, man. I know. Path found. We're supposed to return it there. Should have gotten down to here. Oh, it's length. It has this has to be um a list like that. So it can't be a table with keys that are numbers. It has to be some a table with some things in it like that. There we go. Okay, we're done with that one. Next test. The next function, MPC guide heuristic. How do we test this one? We have a bunch of starting entities and end, excuse me, ending entities. It's just going to look at the first one for both and get the position component and then going to compute the Manhattan distance between the two. Hmm. You want to rewrite something you made in JavaScript. Anyone recommend rewriting it in TypeScript? I think people do recommend writing stuff in TypeScript. 
Yeah, TS Chas says, why not C++? Exactly. Why not Java? Why not Python or Lua? Yeah, exactly. We need more info. <laughs> I've heard good things about TypeScript if you have problems with bugs that are type-related. Or if you just want to learn something new that's cool, I guess. I think they were just joking. We're assuming, I guess we should assume that it needs to be uh, still JavaScript and you're rewriting it just to uh, refactor it, right? I would use TypeScript if the reason you're refactoring is because you had bugs that were type-related. Otherwise, why bother? Uh, unless you really wanted to. Because, or uh, do what you want because a pirate is free. You're a, you're a pirate, matey. Yeah. Rather than mocking that, I could just leverage that. So this can be a pretty simple test. So I can just say game.components.position and then give some uh, start entity is 10, end entity is 11, position of start is, and let's say unrelated entity or something. Unrelated entity, 12. Uh, start entity, x equals, uh, two, y equals four, right? And then to the end, let's go to three, negative two. So we're gonna expect equal, just the Manhattan distance between them, so that's one plus six, that's seven. For guide heuristic, if it's given, it's gonna be given two lists, right? And the lists will have start entity and unrelated entity, and then end entity and unrelated entity. Actually, let's say un an unrelated entity one, unrelated entity two, and let's, Let's go through the, all the motions of making positions for them just 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 out of out of completeness. So we'll put like a totally different set of coordinates here and make them like all over the place. And um properly fold this so we can read it easier. Like so, run. It fails. Attempt to index a number value on line 40 here. Oh, it has to have entity in it. Shoot. So these have to be, um, each of these has to be a table. Entity equals. Let's do that with multi-cursor. Entity equals. There. Nope, still not right. Why do you use Lua for the back end? Uh, don't have a command for that yet. But I should probably make one. Let me explain it. Let me find that. There it is. Marcus asks, why do you use Lua for the back end? Because the back end server is right now a bit complicated to restart if I change the logic and I don't have dynamically loadable modules. So for things that I want to change quickly and iterate over, I'm not quite sure what I want and I just want to kind of prototype things, uh, decided to add a scripting system and have the scripts run for all of the systems in the entity component system. So for example, the regeneration system, every three seconds to go and add a hit point to any NPC that's injured, right? I can write it in Lua and then I can I can change, I can say, hey, we want to, we want the NPCs to heal by two hit points every turn. It's, it's done, it's really quick to do that. So I just picked Lua in scripting language in general, just as a very uh, e quick and easy way to modify the, the 
the logic of the game on the fly. So in the long run, I might remove Lua and replace it with like loadable C++ modules or something else. But right now it's just a convenient way to make quick changes to the game logic. So another reason why you might want to use Lua in the game is if you want to allow it to be um, modded. So the mods created for the game might be written in a scripting language to allow the modders to be able to modify the game without needing to recompile the game. So like I might, conceivably I might allow some users, some players of my game to have access in a limited sense to the, to the ECS scripts and allow them to add custom logic to the game, custom logic to the game. And I wouldn't need to give them the source code of the game. I just give them permission to add or edit some subset of the scripts of the game. So um, I could also do it in C++, but I would need a, a hot swappable loadable module system that I don't have yet. But I've heard that, uh, what is his name? Uh, how come I'm having a, I can't remember his name right now. The other guy making a game from scratch. <laughs> Uh, someone's gonna, someone in chat will remember. There's another streamer who was making a game from scratch on stream. Not Tim. Uh, homegrown game? No, that's not his name. I'll remember it in a bit. But there's someone else making a game engine, basically. Yeah, Handmade Hero. There, thank you, TS Joss. Handmade Hero, I've heard his game, instead of using a scripting language for hot swapping logic he actually has a hot swappable loadable module system so i've played around with that it you, you can do it it's a little for me it's a little bit more complicated and so I, i'm opting for a quick and easy solution which is to use a scripting language yeah hot reloading yep so if you ha support loadable modules you have to load them and then call into them to pass them any dependencies they need and any callbacks you might need to register and then to unload them you have to have a you have to have basically a procedure to uh, stop whatever threads they're running have them release their resources have them release you know tell them we're going to unload you now so better save all your data then unload them and then find the new version of it copy it over load it so it's a bunch of things that aren't built into any of the libraries or the language itself and so i'd have to add them i played around with that and but but not for this iteration of the game okay what's going on here attempting to call a nil value oh manhattan distance isn't defined yeah we can we can give the manhattan distance uh, just copy it from another test i guess doesn't matter which one, just pull it from that one's fine. Run. Nice. Okay. Next. Follow path. Okay, this is a complicated one. Can I skip this one and do the easier ones first? <laughs> I promise I'll get back to it. Actually, let's just leave uh let's just leave a failing test in that I'll get back to. So this one will be, uh, actually, what if I just make all the tests now? How many do I need? A bunch. Follow path. Actually, let's, let's just make them all fail for moon unit, expect true, false. So they'll all mark, they'll all be marked a failure at first because I'm just making placeholders. Patrolling, guiding, returning, and act. There we go. Why do I use nil? Where am I using nil? Oh, like right here. So nil is the equivalent of null or none, or you know, different languages define it different ways, but it basically means the absence of a value. In the context of a delta change to a, a component in my ECS, nil is a placeholder meaning remove that field completely from 
the corresponding dictionary that we put it in, putting it in. So basically it says remove the, the value checkpoint from the NPC completely. Um, it also works the same way in a table in Lua. If this, if NPC Delta in the real game was a direct Lua table and not a JSON or dictionary or object, then just assigning it nil would um, effectively removes that key from the table. Um, you can't do that in all programming languages. Like in Python, you would say delete npc.checkpoint, right? If we were end up modifying it directly. In Lua, you can just say that. And in mine, because it's a full round trip, we have to say we're going to create a delta, and the delta is explicitly... Um, it's just a signal saying we want to we want to have the executor remove the key completely. That's all that is. Thank you for that follow. All right, I broke it up like that because I want to pick the easy ones first. This one's super easy, right? All I really need to do is have um, substitutes for these functions and check that it's called. So that is a function. Oops. That takes. A context. Let's keep it super simple. So test context is doesn't matter what I put here as long as it's a table that has something in it, right? Foo bar, and then we'll have um, local um, dispatched, and we'll have dispatched equals patrolling. Well, let's just put the full word in there. Eh, no, we're gonna keep it short. Patrolling. And then we have to override all the things from the dispatch table. Actually, wait a minute. Will this even work? Because that's local. It won't work because this executes last. It will have already built this table and we have no access to it because it's local. So scratch that. I can't do it that way. Uh, to make it easier to test, I could just not make it local. Yeah, I'm not going to make it local. I'm going to make it global so I can test it easier. And then I'll just override the table here. And actually, I don't even need to use the same keywords, right? I can do whatever the heck I want. I can say uh, th uh, this equals... Function context that equals some other function with a context. And in both of these, I can say moon unit expect equal test context context. And then I can say dispatched equals, and then I can make this one say that. And then we just call it. So, oh, this needs an NPC. Okay, fine. We'll put an NPC. Well, let's just do it. Let's do it this way. Define it, and then before each test, we'll put the NPC in here. NPC has a state. This. There. And then we can say... Um, Oh, we should check the return value. We'll have this one return true, and we'll have this one return false. So, moon unit expect true act on the context. And then we change it to be that. And then that should be false. And then we'll put we'll add in here moon unit expect equal or dispatched. And that'll be that. Those closing parens will cause problems. The end. Uh, that paren goes with that paren because this function is actually an argument to this function call up here. So it's just kind of weird. The other way I could do it would be to to indent it, I guess, like that. And then maybe, um, especially if I do that, then it's then then. But I'm just being I'm just being concise with that. Um, I think also I was being concise because the where the function is actually defined 
if I do it this way, it would be a different line number than that. And so the little markers that the test explorer puts would be on the wrong line. Does that make sense? If I put them on if I have the function begin on the same line as the as the registration call, then um it'll put this bar on the at the correct line. I had additional code earlier which had extra parens. Oh, okay. But yeah, if anyone else is looking and, and wondering why I have a parentheses there, that's because it matches that one. It's just not obvious because I combine this function definition with this function call. And sometimes people do the same thing in JavaScript, right? They'll say like register some callback and they'll say like foo and then they'll have like a arrow function. I've seen that a lot. And you'll look and like say, why is there a parentheses there? Why is there a curly brace there? It's the parentheses matches that, and then that curly brace matches that um, arrow function. It's kind of the same kind of thing. All right. Run this, I guess. So this failed Y. Con, oh, because that should be test context. And now it passes. All right. So these ones that fail because they don't have any code filled in. Returning is super easy, right? It's just going to take the NPC delta and call something, and if it returns true, fill in a bunch of other things. So we have two paths through this function. Context. And it doesn't need to return anything. We're just going to call it twice, and we'll have um, something in here that has to have a NPC delta in it. Mm. Just make it a list. Guess the more proper TDD way, instead of having a global MVC guide dispatch function, would be to use dependency injection. Well, kind of in a roundabout way doing that by making this a global, then this becomes sort of like a default dependency, and then we're ending up injecting something else here, right? So in a roundabout way, yeah. It's just the way I want to use this normally. Um, it's going to be always using this table associated with it. I'm just making it a dependency that I can inject in this way to make this independently testable from these three functions. So, yeah. We're using dependency injection in a roundabout way. Oh, I forgot to wave hi to Marcus, to, to um, Maccus and Bryce. I guess was talking, oh, uh, making a guess about who I was talking about. Yeah, it was Handmade Hero. It wasn't Casey or Soding or Tim. The Postal Rat, I didn't see you chat. Or I did and I didn't see your name. Now I'm looking for where, when you chatted. Postal Rat, where where is your chat? I don't see it. You're hiding. Postal Rat. Postal Rat's hiding like a Postal Rat. There you are. <laughs> yeah, but you must have chatted because it said you wrote you kind of prefer the characters, but it's not a big deal either way. Oh, that was like half an hour ago. My my apologies. Near the end of my stream, or when I get hungry, which is about this time, a couple things actually happened. I stop waving to new people because I think I just get into my work too much and also there's I, I tend to see a lot of people coming and going around this time uh oh what's the what are the tears in the feels bad man for what happened did I miss something what'd I do what'd I miss Monka S no no I'm not leaving I'm not leaving no don't worry I'll I'll be here at least an hour Maybe uh, an hour and a half. I gotta go in two hours to go pick up kids from school, but I'm free until then. All right. Yeah, so this this is a default dependency injected just because it's a global. This, we're, depend we're injecting test stub, basically mocks, and that's how I made that independently testable. Now, returning... In PC Delta, 
and we're going to have that. Oh, I, 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 I messed up here. That calls that, right? This we have to stub, though. Function context. And then so we'll do the same kind of, just check that, that it's the same context. And then, um, I don't know. Let's move this down to here, and then we'll just define it, but not declare it. Declare it, but not define it, I mean. And then maybe another one for... Um, Oh, the semantics of this is if the, the it follow path returns true if the path is complete. So path complete. So we would return that. So oh, thank you for that follow. This is the arrange. Here's the act and assert. So if path complete is true, we would expect expect this to return, no, not to return true, but we'd expect these other side effects. Expect equal some junk. It's put into the NPC delta. Test context dot. And then when it is, f the false is easier, right? Because then this will be empty. And I'm going to move that down to here and here. And then, so this test will be path. Well, we reach the end of the path. We uh, do not reach the end of the path. There we go. Come on, Rally Monkey. Debating everybody like that. <laughs> The game has a win condition now, can transition to the next level hype. A win condition? Well, this is when the guide gets to the end of his path. Actually, when he re he's returning, right? So it's when he gets home. When he gets home, he's going to patrol, right? So we reach the end of the path. Uh, go back to patrolling. We do not reach the end of the path. Continue returning. So that's path complete false. We um, don't put anything in the delta. It is empty. And this will have all these things in it. Right? Oops. And expected to close something. Hmm. It's expected here. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Toulouse. For some reason I didn't that didn't register as that's the wrong delimiter. <laughs> Did I do the same thing down uh, somewhere else, too? Uh, yeah. Wrong delimiter. Wrong delimiter is all around. Now what? Another one? Yeah. Missing delimiter. Wrong delimiter, actually. Boom. Okay. And it failed. Why? Tend to call a nil value context. It shouldn't be context. It should be test context. Yay. Passing. Wait a minute. Not passing? What? Hold on. Oh, I clicked on that. It's running all the tests in there. Uh, that is not... I'm looking at the wrong thing. <laughs> 103. And wait a minute. This one. 
115. Okay. Expected nil? Oh, I shouldn't say local again. I guess that... Mm, is that what it is? Yeah, interesting. So that, what, makes a new thing that's no longer captured there? That's interesting to know. Hmm. Who's they? I'm trying to understand who's they with the 5-3 versus 16-9. Uh, I don't know. I'm missing something. All right, 115. Actual value missing checkpoint. Wait a minute. Another local? Mm, oh, yeah, maybe. Yep, probably. Yep, that was it. Thank you, Toulouse. <laughs> the ominous they, them. Don't trust them. <laughs> I think guiding is the same. So let me take returning and kind of make another copy of it. And this is guiding. We reach the end of the path. Um, it's like chat and return, right? Chat and find a path back. Actually, there's going to be two variations of this, right? And uh, find successfully find find a path back. Begin following the return path, or begin returning. Um, start returning. And then there's the um, problem of if he gets stuck at the end. And un and unsuccess well, chat and try but fail to find a, a path back. What does he do there? He just patrols the end area? That would be bad. Um, start patrolling. Let me put a note here. Note. Because the NBC is likely far from home, this is probably bad. And will result in the NBC immediately trying, uh, immediately being yoinked by their tether. I can read word this. This will probably be bad and result in the NPC immediately being yoinked by their tether. Okay, anyway. So the chat, oh, there's gonna be chat, isn't there? Hmm. Do I have that in here? I do. Look at that. I'm so cool. So good at this. Just kidding. <laughs> so we need to have updates. Updates is empty, and so we'll expect that chat. Um. Like that. What shortcut am I using to auto wrap the lines to the column limit? I set it up as Alt Q, but I don't think that's the default. Rewrap is what I'm using. Rewrap comment slash text, and that is this plugin called Rewrap. I don't know what the default com uh, key is, but I mapped it to Alt Q. Oh, okay. So Sublime is Alt Q. I guess it is the default keybind. Rewrap. There you go. 
Well, thank you for putting that highlighted question. We we're just talking about how do I, how am I doing the um, re-wrapping right here? It's Alt Q does that. Kind of cool. It doesn't work for all kinds of comments for me though. Uh, I have trouble getting it to work with stuff in C++ here. Let me go find something. Ah, uh, no, it won't be there. Shoot. Value.cvp, for example. Something with comments in it. Yeah, like this. I like to wrap things like that. If I uh, ask rewrap to do that, though, it doesn't actually work at all. And um, something like this, I th whoops. So, uh, shoot, something like this where it needs wrapping. Uh, actually, that doesn't need wrapping. <laughs> something that obviously needs wrapping, but it's a parameter I have a problem with. Yeah, like this. If I hit Control Q on that. It it puts them. It it does that paragraph style, which I don't like. So it has its limitations. I actually put in a a ticket for the rewrap tools developers, asking them asking them if they could have the rewrap tool support that mo that style of um, paragraph indentation, and I never got anything back about it. That's okay, Toulouse. Don't worry about it. All right, so what are we expecting? We're expecting this is the way out. Stay safe. Right here. And it's going to call find path. Instead of follow path. Well, in addition to follow path. Hey, uh, Tech Phoenix, how are you doing? Okay. It's also, okay, this, for this one, like it's guiding, not returning, that's one problem. This one's already good, right? We don't reach the end, it just skips out all entirely. So that's done. So the difference between these two is what NBC guide find path returns. So I already mocked that, right? I did up here. So let's do that. And put that up here. Hmm. Wait a minute, what? Hold on, I'm confused. What's... Oh, that's put into the context by MPC guide. All of that. Before calling that. But when we get to here... Okay, there is something in there. It's called waypoint return. All right. So that should be waypoint is return. Ret. There we go. All done with the testing framework. I'm getting there. The tools are there, but I'm, um, I had these five scripts left to test and I, uh, got these two done and I'm on this one. I'm kind of racing the, the, the stream though. Like, I don't know if I'll get to the end this uh, this one's actually short, so really this is just the one I'm working on now, and then the pathfinding, and then I'll pretty much be done. And then so that means tomorrow, assuming I'm streaming tomorrow, I'll be actually writing some new scripts to try to get our friend George here to not um, aggro incorrectly. <laughs> so fix his aggro to use um, a cost function and not a direct line of sight. Um, Manhattan distance. 
Okay. So is that the only thing I expect in the context, actually, or is there more? No, there also will be a bunch of other stuff. Um, you know, I can just shorten this. Ex expect return for context dot waypoint. Like that. Yeah, let's just do that. So then we need to set path found to true for this one. And false for this one. So if it's true, it will go into the ret state. Checkpoint, progress, and there's also a guided is reset. And then the path... Uh, can I copy that from somewhere else? Maybe not. No. Oh, well. Path is going to be json.array of uh, test path, right? Do I have a test path? I do not. I had it somewhere. I thought I did. George will be even better at his job. Yes. We're, we're going to try to improve his script. I would like to get as much of the initial tutorial area done as possible. That way, when people are new to the stream and I say, hey, go check out what I have so far, they can actually log in and actually have a reasonable chance of figuring out how to play the game. And and if not, they would give me more feedback and I go improve George and I improve the environment and the controls at the beginning of the game. Enough so that people say, okay, I kind of get it. And then reach the point where there's at the end of the content and they say, okay, I, I, I figured out how to play your game. Now please make a game. <laughs> That's what I'm aiming to get to. I could have sworn I did a check for this. Why not hire real people to play NPCs? Because they, I'd have to pay them, Nui. George, I don't have to pay. He doesn't care about money or wealth. He doesn't need to be fed. <laughs> He's just a digital construct. <laughs> You'll play one of the... Yeah, but then I'd have to pay you, meme clear bombs. That is something that we could do. I mean, there's nothing that says I can't have designated people in the game world who interact with other players and say, hey, you know, and just actually role play, right? Up to four hours a day. <laughs> what do I do for the other 20 mean clear bombs? Do I have to shut the game down? <laughs> we could do that while we're stream while I'm streaming. That might be an interesting way for half stream interaction. What if we had NPCs that viewers could control through the command system of the bot? So we could have a command that says, George, go on rampage mode, and George would just start pathing around and kill all the monsters and then return. That might be kind of fun, right? So we, what if we had that? What if we had NPCs that had commands linked to them that while I'm streaming, those commands would be invoking scripts that would modify NPC behavior? And we'd let like VIPs and above control it. There we go, Twitch plays. It'd be more like VIPs control and direct the NPCs. Yeah, we could do that. We could have, we could have, actually, that's a great idea, 715209. Not to kill me, but what if we had high level NPCs, like monsters, that were normally like dormant, like sitting in some like area and just that, you know, off the side of the map? And in response to a chat command from a VIP, they would go seek out and destroy some player in the same zone. And maybe you'd cache... Maybe it would be something like if the NPC could kill the player within a, a certain number of moves, the um, the viewer in chat would gain some points. And if the target defended the attack and defeated the NPC, they would get some points. Have some kind of viewer contest. 
but it would be um, one-sided, where one side would be viewer-controlled, and the other one would be someone would be actually playing. Don't put yourself in the game and get Lord Britished. Yeah, I don't want that to happen. Perhaps it costs points based on the distance traveled or something. Yeah, so there's lots of details we can iron out, but uh, I do want to have more stream interaction when I have the mechanics in the game to support it. And that should be soon, right? We can start developing scripts that are uh, driven by the Golem integration and just populate the game world with stuff that is viewer interacted. It has viewer interaction. Okay. I have to have a test path. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm a little confused because I thought I had a test path at one point. Did I not? Um, I guess I could search for this. And just look at the... T okay, it is only in two places. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, it wasn't that, right? It was... One of these. I uh, was it the top one? Ah, uh -huh. that's what it was. Wait, why did it find it like that? Oh, I see what I did. Yeah, so that's what I want. I, path found is not a Boolean. Like I had down here. It's not a Boolean. It's actually a list. So this should be um this list. And then this should be an empty list. All right. So given a list of checkpoints, uh, we'll expect that list to show up here. Right there, right? Because it takes the path and puts it in there. Okay, and then... Um, and then it'll also do that chat. And this will say, actually it's the exact same thing there. Patrol checkpoint progress, but then guided also gets set to nil. And we still have the chat too. Okay. After I get this working, I gotta take a quick break. Oh, wait, it didn't detect the tests right. Uh, let me rescan. I have a feeling that I have a syntax error. My iPad is at 65%. It's drained 35% running this featured chat the whole three hours. Or three and a half hours. Okay, what's the bug? NPC is nil. On line 170 here. That NPC. Okay, am I not setting the NPC? Oh, yeah, indeed. Um, NPC equals, what do I, What does it expect? Guided. There's a guided flag. Got it. And that's the... Um, Oh, test player entity, and it never defined it. So that should be that, right? Um, guided equals that. And I think I'd have that if check, just in case it got into the guiding state and the guided NPC, or I mean the guided player no longer exists. Then it would just path back. It's like if you if the player deleted their account while being led by George. I don't think I need to have a test for that right now. I'm gonna need to put a comma there and copy this right down to here and here. Run that again. Okay. Again, it's getting confused. 
Extra key two on line 178. Oh, it didn't, to another thing? Hold on. It should only do one chat message. Oh, I, did I forget to clear it? I did. I forgot to clear it. Right there. Cool. All right. So I got two left in guide. And then I'll need to do pat the pathfinding, and then I'll pretty much be done. But I need to take a quick break. So I'll be back in like two or three minutes, okay? I'm back. Hello. All right. No chat happened while I was gone. Everyone's asleep or left me. Boo hoo. Welcome back after three long minutes. How many minutes was that? The five minutes instead of three. Okay. All right. So two left. Maybe I should say five minutes and then when I come back after. Four minutes, it'll be like, oh, I'm early. Follow path, right? Or should I do patrolling? 
The trolling's really simple. It just tries the aggression. Yeah, let's do this one first. It's it expects an NPC that has a home position, and it sets that to tether for this one. Okay. Uh, patrolling. There we go. Definitely more than one second. Yeah, it's better though to say your estimate to overestimate, right? It's better to overestimate than to underestimate. I think. Patrolling. Test context equals. And um, we're going to want two different things, right? So let's define a local co test context. And then depends on this, which is a function that takes the context that we can expect that. And then we'll have a local um, NBC aggression return. Just return that, right? And then act NPC takes some action, uh, performs, um, chooses to act aggressively. NPC chooses not to act aggressively so one so wanders instead okay so that's false whereas um that's true right and then in both cases we want an npc i love multi-cursor have i t said that before home can be anything we want right so let's just say foo equals bar or something like that. Actually, let's just put home and then we'll define what home is up here. Local home equals where the heart is. Is that the same? Home is where the heart is. <laughs> I get kooky when I get towards the end of my stream. And then wander, wandered. It also uses the context, right? So I can have the same kind of expectation up here and just return wandered. No, this is the other way around. Wandered is true. So here we'll say wandered is false to reset it every time. And then he, uh, we're going to call controlling in both cases Con test context here uh we'll say moon unit expect false wandered and this returns something itself right ooh so this would be like expect true And this one um, should be true. And then we're actually going to return, this should return whatever wander returns. So we should return something in here. Local wander return. And just for kicks, let's have this say um, wander return equals gold. Moon unit. Uh, wrong place. Moon unit expect equal NPC aggression. No, oh, wander return from that. Run the test again. Oops. Hold on.
Did I not spell that right? I didn't spell it right. No, I did. So, okay, is this just confused? Let's just recycle this. Run that again. Nope, it wasn't confused, it was just me. Oh, again, it's a local problem that I did before. Okay, cool. Down to one. Follow path. Save the best for last. Follow path. So it runs the aggression script just like the patrol did. And if it chose to be aggressive, it returned false, right? Because the return value of follow path is, did we reach the end of the path? If we're fighting, then we're not at the end of the path ever. If we're not fighting, then I guess, let's say if they're not guided anymore. What does this say? We reach here if there are no enemies in range, we're not returning to the last progress point. If a player is being guided, Pause, all right, so pause and stop conditions. All right, so then it means this is just pr pursuing the, the next checkpoint in the path. Right, and I've been meaning to fix this. We don't really need to do NPC pursuit triposition because the next checkpoint should be adjacent. So we can do try um, direction instead of position and then um, if it fails, then we can just do recompute the path rather than getting stuck. Because this will get stuck right now, right? It will just never go into this at all. And then just always be returning false. Why do I have this distance to checkpoint? Oh, because we assume that we're one closer... So that if we get to the end, we're at, okay, I got it. It's easier to do that than to test X and Y are the same again, or to recompute that. Okay, while I'm at it, I can remove these comments, because I don't really need those. All right. So first things first, we want to set up the uh, act assert and arrange scenario one would be an aggressive action is taken and then we'll say no aggressive action is taken where or what are we just trying to do uh, let's skip the NPC guided no no player is being guided so just uh, pursue the next checkpoint. Uh, reach, reach the end. Pursue the next checkpoint, reaching the end. And then another variation where we don't reach the end. Not yet reaching the end. So that'll, that'll cover this code here. Right? I could also, we could also test if we're already at the end, I guess. Yeah, why not? Pursue the next checkpoint. Um, already at the end. The difference will be we just don't try to pursue it because we'll say, oh, we're already there. Now, why do we have this check here? Oh, right. Uh, um, I, I, I can just do it here, right? Already at the end. And let's just make two variations of this. 
Uh, this is the the last checkpoint in the path. And then the last one would be, this is not the last checkpoint. Or there's more, there are more checkpoints in the path. Okay, and then we'll go into the guided part. So one is that, so there are two actions, I guess, here, right? We can either be waiting for the player to catch up, or we could be giving up. If neither, it will proceed to pathing, to, to moving. Okay, so down here, no aggressive action is taken. A player is being guided. But is uh, let's do the gaunt. Let's do the uh, mm, which one first? Uh, but has just crossed the threshold of being too far away. Have the NPC inform the player that they are waiting. Okay, next case. Player's being guided, but it's just cross, but has... A player is being guided and has been too far away for at least one turn. But not not too long. Have the NPC wait, and then the player is being guided and has been f too far away for too long. Have the NPC give up. All right. So that's a lot of test cases. I really did save the best for last, haven't I? Okay. Right, so the easy one first. We'll have an aggression, the function that takes the context. So that means I'll have a local test context that I'll want to moon unit expect equal test context. And then aggression is going to return something. So we have local NPC aggression return that will just return that. So this will say true and then call follow path. Con test context. Whoops. That was totally not the right key sequence. Okay, we'll have to have a bunch of things in the con test context, right? So we'll need to have an NPC, which is used for checkpoint and path and home. So a bunch of stuff. Actually, this, that stuff is constant, right? Not quite. But we can... I'm going to do the other approach here, having a local reset test function. And then we set it there to, like, defaults. So NPC equals some stuff. Amongst the stuff is checkpoint. Let's have it start at zero. Actually, it's it's one base because it's Lua. <laughs> uh, path. Let's have let's keep it simple. We'll have two checkpoints in the path. The raw checkpoint looks like it's a tuple, so just a tuple. So like two four and then like seven f five. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, I can keep that on one line. So there's the path. What else does the NPC have? Home, which is a table which has a range in it. And the range, what's the range used for? Oh, it's used for the tether, isn't it? Right. So 
that's how far away from the checkpoint you can get before you get tethered back to it. Which really doesn't matter. It's only put into the context for this guy, so we can just make sure it's a constant of some kind. Uh, let's define it up here. Tether range is, I don't know, 8 or something, and then just set that there. Path checkpoint. Okay, there's progress. So this is set up so that... Where is that assigned? It's got to be assigned somewhere. Oh, right here. I think the way I set this up, uh, every time you make a step towards the goal, it updates this progress field in the NPC's component, and we use that as the new tether point. Right, because if they pull aggro mid path, and then they defeat the enemy, when they when th they should get snapped back to that progress point. That progress point is probably called from one or two places, right? We should be, well, it's the same position as the checkpoint, right? Oh, wait a minute, let me think about this. We're always going to pursue the checkpoint. If we're not at the checkpoint, we're making progress to reach the checkpoint. So if we happen to be pulled off course by going off to fight something, then we'll be quite a distance away. And then, right, so that, that sets us up so the next time, if we're too far away from that, we will um, snap back through the, the aggression system, which has a tether. That's right. All right. So I don't really care, because we're stubbing that out anyway. Uh, but we will need to check that it goes into the delta. All right. In fact, I'll have a test case for that. An aggressive action is taken, and this will be an, an, ag an aggressive, well, uh, the tether. Uh, the NPC is making progress towards a checkpoint, and Actually, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same kind of thing right here. Aggressive action is, t is taken. No progress towards the next checkpoint. I think that's only the initial condition where it'll be false. So that's the initial condition. From then on, I think we always set this progress. We're, we only clear the progress when we get to the next check. Oh, every next checkpoint? Okay, so it gets reset every checkpoint. So this should say, no progress towards the next checkpoint. Yeah, so every time you reach the next checkpoint, your progress gets reset. Pro progress has been made towards the next checkpoint. No progress has yet been made towards the next checkpoint. Okay, so for this one, no progress means we keep it empty. All right. What else in NPC do I need? Besides perhaps setting progress guided. So um, this doesn't matter because we shouldn't reach that point, right? It should return early. So we can expect a false. But I need to make the, yeah, regression, yeah, exactly. So this one will set uh, test context MPC progress. And it's expected to be, actually it can be whatever I want it to be. Foo equals bar. <laughs> we will expect that to be um, put into the tether of the context. So moon unit expect equal 
this for test content dot tether. Uh, I could put that on one line, right? Yeah, why not? Basically to test that line. Yep, approaching four hour mark. But I can go, I mean, I gotta eat, but I, I have another hour. Let's see if I can make it to the end of this. This is the last, this is pretty much the last thing. I can, there's some, a few loose ends I can finish up later. Expect, so that's done, right? No aggression is taken, so that is a false. In that case, um, I don't need to test that, so I'll just leave, leave that out. Oh, I need to do reset test before all of these. Reset test. Ah, can't type. Okay. So, um, no players guided, so just pursue the next checkpoint. So that means I need to have, so um, this reaches the end. We just wanna make sure it reaches the end. So reaching the end means okay, I need to have Manhattan distance in here, like that. It's gonna compare, oh, where's position grabbed from? Oh, context, needs a position. Oops. I only looked at NPC, I didn't look at the other things. So there's NPC Delta. Actually, let's make that part of res, actually it is part of reset test. NPC Delta is empty list and then position is this needs an X and a Y and a Z. Uh, X equals two, Y equals four, Z equals 42, why not? Should I test this or one or just not bother? So it's gonna look at the first thing in our checkpoint is okay, that's bad because there it's like we're already there. Um I think I want the position to be different every run, so let me take the position out and just set it here. Test context dot position equals that. So that's where at the end, right? Checkpoint is one, we're at that. Oh no, pursue, so if we're ne right next to it, it should pursue it. So distance will be one, we'll pursue it. So that means we want to check that that progress is set and then this is called. And that takes a context also. And that returns something. So let's um, pursue. Pursuit, pursuit result return. Yeah, why not? And I want to know that it's called. Pursued, or pursuit taken. So let's reset that every time. What about Helvetica font? Have people been complaining about the font though? Oh, the font in the game. Yeah, I can check it out later. Why do I have that under notes? This should actually be the plan, not the notes. 
Whoa. Fix the indentation there. There we go. I'll check that out later, Nui. I wanted to have a font that matches the style, though. Just assumed? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's not set in stone where it needs to go, right? It's whatever works. Okay, yes. So we will um, have pursuit return true. Aggression return false. Pursuit return true. Expect pursuit to happen. We don't care about the that actually, but I do. I just I'll we'll reuse this. Or no, I won't. True pursuit. Taken, right? What else? What other, what other side effects do we expect this progress to be a certain thing, right? Test context.mbc delta. So it's going to set it to a JSON object. Yeah, what am I doing? And it's not NPC delt. Oh, it is. It's progress equals a uh, JSON object. X equals the position. So that's. I guess I can just reuse it. Takes the X, Y, and Z, and then adds in the range, right? NPC home range. Okay, what else? Oh, we can also detect that, right? We should expect target position to be whatever checkpoint is. Up here. Test context NPC checkpoint for context dot target position. Actually, it's not checkpoint, right? It's there was a raw checkpoint, so it's actually um, a structure we should expect. And it's x equals um. NPC path indexed by that dot x y and z and then a range. What's the range called? Okay, the range is constant. NPC home range. Okay, the raw checkpoint doesn't have an X and a Y. It's it's like that, right? One and two. It's from a tuple. And the Z coordinates from the position. Better. NPC path. Then you get the checkpoint index and look up one of the two things in the tuple. And then the path will have, and the position will have X, Y, and Z or Z. Home, NBC has a home which has a range. Okay, got it. All right. <sighs> a lot of stuff. <laughs> Can I just run this as uh, so far to see how far I got? Yeah, and at least test it this far. Uh, position was nil. And it was call from line 147. There. Oh. Wait a minute. It should have returned then.
Why did it? Why did it not? NPC guide follow path. NPC return aggression return is true. Then why did it go? Oh wait a minute, it's earlier. Uh, I think I know why. Yeah, it, it caches that stuff earlier. It really doesn't need to though. Yeah, let me move this code. All of this stuff isn't needed until later. We need the progress. We don't need the checkpoint until later. We don't need it until here, really. Actually, I don't even need it there, right? Uh, I don't need it in, whoops. I don't need it until down here. Fifty-nine. Oh, we do need the position. Okay. Okay, let's put a default position then. X equal, I don't know, two, Y equals four, Z equals 42. Why not? One sixty. Oh, am I? No. Yeah, this thing is just getting in my way. Okay, missing. So progress is missing value. Wait, what? Oh, is it not an actual? Oh, it's not. Wait a minute. Hold on. Is it not returning a JSON object? It is. Oh, but it got put in there, so it got the JSON thing stripped off. So I don't need the JSON object anymore. Huh, I'm being raided. Ah, Mike in principle is raiding me. <laughs> Still alive, yeah. A little bit over time today. I'm 11 minutes over. I'm trying to finish up one more test. And I'm pretty much done with making tests for all my Lua scripts. Yes. Almost getting there. 411 right now, yep. Hey there, Mike and Principal. Thank you for the raid. I hope you had a good stream today. If you don't know Mike and Principal, you should check out his stream. Also, you should check out the game he's working on. He's actually working on an expansion to it with uh, more game mechanics. So it's a, it's a game that kind of has elements of speed running and challenge and puzzle and um it's rage inducing if you're into perfection it's really 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 challenging but it's also got kind of like a more laid back mode if if you just uh want to enjoy a, a bit of a little bit of puzzle solving and a bit of um of uh i don't know what you call it arcade action um check out his game more things huh nice yeah, so I'm working on my game. The scripts for my game are in Lua. The uh, engine I'm making is uh, all custom made pretty much. As uh, Mike likes to say, I'm kind of nutty that way or insane or however you want to call it. I just enjoy doing stuff from scratch and this is a hobby turned into a lifetime goal that I'm trying to achieve right now. Good old George is still there. That's because I haven't yet changed any of his scripts. I'm just still writing tests to get the test coverage up so then I'll be more comf comfortable in making changes. So I'm just about done. I'm uh, shoring up the tests with um, coverage for these bits of script where we control NPCs that wander or pull aggro or do pathfinding. And I'm actually doing the pathfinding one right now. So this particular script or this test is that the, uh, NPC guide, which is George, when he's in a uh, mode to um, follow a path, that he actually does everything that he's expected. So if an aggressive action is taken, you don't make progress towards the next checkpoint. Or um, actually, there's two cases. You could take an aggressive action where progress has already been made towards the checkpoint or not. And then um, you could not take an aggressive action and you just go towards the next next checkpoint if you're not guiding anyone. If you are guiding someone, uh, you might pursue the next checkpoint. 
and be at the end or not. And if you're not at the end, the player might be too far away. You might have to wait for them, or the NPC might give up waiting. So the different test cases I'm trying to fill in here right now. And I'm trying to find. I'm trying to make this one pass because I don't want to have some bug here that I then copy paste everywhere. This is saying that on line 166 here, the progress doesn't include a range. So what happened to the range? There's a range there. So why isn't it showing up there? We see delta, right? Yep. That might be if that's nil. NPC home range should be, should be set though. NPC home range tether range, which is eight. So why would it say actual value missing key range? Oh, one thing it might be. Oh, where am I? I've lost track of where I am. One might be. One thing might be if if progress is empty completely. Let me see. Yeah, this might be empty completely. What does progress actually have? Checkpoint. Checkpoint. Well, that's wacky. Oh, Delta has a checkpoint in it. Uh -huh. Oh, so it got into here. So I thought the distance was zero. Did I hit this set, set this up wrong? The checkpoints are a two four, so it shouldn't have gone into here, but it did for some reason. Why would it? Taking the Manhattan distance from the checkpoint to the current position, which should be different. <coughs> Reminds you of Visual Basic. Yeah, Lua is pretty basic, that's for sure. But it's not very visual. <laughs> Bad joke. Okay, so this is what it should be. For some reason, it's going into this path, though. Hmm, why would that be? Position should be retrieved from the context, and we're setting it there. One, four, and then the, the checkpoints are here. Two, four. So it should be one square away, not zero. For some reason, I wonder if it's because of this. Am I resetting the test? After I set the position, am I doing something stupid like that? It's possible. I do silly things all the time by by mistake. No, I reset the test and then I did that. Okay, that's not it. That'd be something though. Okay, see ya, Mike. Thanks for the raid. What if I make that like 111? No, it doesn't matter. It's it's changing the checkpoint number on me. Right, it's gonna say checkpoint. Ah, uh, wait a minute, what is this? Oh, this is different. So maybe it does need to be a JSON object. Ooh. So maybe the my co okay. So the coordinates aren't right then. So will a one there makes it fail, and that what does a two do? Fail. What about three? Four. That's weird. Getting different results for three. Two, one, what about zero? And then it passes. So one, two, is it because it's exactly one square away? Might be. It might be pursuing and getting there? That's weird. Greater than zero. Oh, it is going into this, isn't it? Wait a minute, hold on. It's going into that, but 
it's missing. Okay, I'm confused. <laughs> Is it recalc? Oh, it's recalculating it. That's what's going on. It's going and doing both of these. Dang it. Okay. It, right, reaching the end. So I wanted it to reach the end. When it reaches the end, it should do that. So this is wrong. It will be a uh, JSON nil. And checkpoint will be two. There we go. All right. So that's working. So that, that means the other test cases are just slightly different. Pursue the next point, not yet reaching the end. So we need to put it a little bit further away. And actually, let me undo a little bit to get back this thing, because I want that. And then redo, because that's what progress is now. And we're not changing the checkpoint number. The progress will be where we were, right? Where we are. It's going to pursue and the distance will be something other than zero, so it'll skip that. And it will return false, not true. Well, hold on. It was returning false either way, because we did not reach the end of the path yet. Right, that's the next test. Okay, got it. So far, so good. Okay, good, 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 good. So then here, we're already at the end, so that's this code. That's reaching, okay, this is different. Already at the end would be put put the coordinates um, at, at the next checkpoint, and it has to be the last checkpoint, so I need to look, I need to change it to uh, 7, 5, checkpoint number 2. So test context dot checkpoint is 2, and it's 7, 5. And if we get, that means we get to this true, so we should expect true. And pursuit is not called, so that's false. And what will it do? It shouldn't have anything in the delta. Okay, messed it up. 202. It's returning false instead. Did I get the coordinates wrong? 7, 5. 7, 5. Okay, that's correct. Checkpoint is 2. Uh, this should not matter. Hmm. It should be checkpoint 2, so it should be 7, 5. And it should compute the distance. The distance should be 0, so it should skip that. It should go into here. It, this should be true now. So it should just return true and not do anything, but it's not. Well, shoot. <laughs> Did I get this right? Is it checkpoint? Oh, no, it's NPC checkpoint. NPC checkpoint. There we go. <laughs> it's just making the test match the code. It's so, so hard when the code is complicated. All right, so this is where there are more checkpoints in the path. So um, actually, it's going to end up pursuing, so I should just copy the code ahead up here. And paste that there. So reach the end of the first checkpoint, so that will return false. We will have pursued. And so it'll skip that. It'll go into here. It'll go into this else. So right, the checkpoint will be 2. Wait a minute, how is that different from the other test? Oh, the coordinate is the same. Or is different. Yeah, okay. And what did I do wrong here? Oh, right, it won't pursue. Yeah, we already reached the end. It only pursues if that's greater than zero. So this just switches to the next point, and it will take another turn before it pursues the next checkpoint. 
Okay. So then this is where we're guiding someone and they're too far away. So I need to, um, that's false. We're never actually going to get into that, are we? It's not going to pursue. It won't give up, though. It's going to wait. Actually, hold on. Yeah, it's going to return false here, right? It won't give up, but it will wait. So re expect false, no pursuit taken, but we'll get a chat message. I don't have a stub for that, so define where that's done. Ch here we go. Put the stub up here. Sure, put it here. Uh, local updates. Mm. We should probably check that all of these don't actually do anything. So let's have reset test set updates to empty list. And technically I need to define updates before I call that because it's that updates that we want to set to empty list. And then all of these places we're going to change to expect no updates. Moon unit expect equal empty list for updates. All right. So here the it, we will get an update. This update will be a chat message. Type equals chat message equals something. It's George taps his foot impatiently. Please follow. It's hard coded right now, unfortunately. Because NBC weight is false. NBC weight isn't even set yet. And let's see if that works. It did not work. Actual key missing one, four. Right, so it didn't chat. Why not? Oh, because I didn't I haven't I haven't fixed this yet. Uh guided has to be set to true. Guided is set where? NPC. So um is this position actually needed? It is. Okay. Guided. And this we want to make the um, test player number, right? Where is this? I don't have it defined yet. Local test player entity. 42. I probably have that variable already assumed in the chat thing, right? Yep, there it is. Okay. So that has to be who we guide. Otherwise, it won't work. And then we need to place them far enough away. So the guided position. So it's going to look up the position of that. So we need to declare that up here. So game components position of test player entity equals x equals you need to put them just far away so just within oh it's hard coded as two <laughs> so two away or greater greater than two so three away would be five y equals four z is 42 so he will not do anything or pursue anything this will be empty actually no it won't be empty it's going to put weight equals whatever this is so weight hold on what is max guide weight counter oh it's not declared because i haven't moved it yet there it is take that out and put it there so it's 10 so um, we'll expect 10, right? Unless I start it, hold on. What should it, what would it start at? Oh, we subtract one from it, so it'd be nine. 
and expect false. Anything else put into NBC Delta? No. Okay, good. So let's try that. Nope. Weight is missing. Oh, wait. Uh, that should be like that. Right? No, no, no. Hold on. That's like that. Why does it say actual value missing key one, though? Oh, no. Wait is missing, and then on the next line down here, it's so it didn't chat and it didn't wait. Why not? You should be waiting for him. He's far away. Um. Oh, that's NPC guided. That's why he's not waiting for him. Now he should be. Yay. Okay, cool. So he's going to tap his foot impatiently and say, please follow, if he hasn't been waiting before. So if he's guided and has been far away at least one turn, but not too long, so that would be that weight would be in the NPC. So weight is like five, and then so the weight will go to four, and there won't be a chat. Right? So far, so good. Okay. And then if he waits too long, so that will be a one, instead of going to a zero, it will say give up. And so it will do that. He'll say, I can't wait forever. And move on. Forget, do you prefer suggestions in GitHub or in-game tickets? Uh, GitHub's what I prefer, but the in-game ticket system's there if you want to use it. Almost done. So this should be, I can't wait forever. I'm off. So guided and wait will have un guided JSON nil and wait will be removed from the NPC component. And it will return true. So that's re expect true. But it does return, so it's not like we're going to pursue a checkpoint right away. Okay, I messed it up. 286, so it didn't return true. Hold on, is that... Oh, it has to be at zero. There we go. Fixed it. Let's run them all. Okay, cool. That means I'm done with the, with the uh, path... With the NPC guide. Done with NPC guide. Uh, wait. No, I'm confused. Why are we in NPC guide? It's the follow path of NPC guide. I never did make the, the pathfinding one. Okay, so... I thought I thought I was one... I thought I was at the end, but I actually just finished that one. So I finished three of these. There's still this one to do. Do I want to, can I write a test for that now or not? You know what, I'm gonna save this for later. I'm hungry. It's really the last thing, I need to write a test for that and then to write a small test for this, well, it's not a small test actually. What is this one? Okay, so I need to write a test for three more things. Yep, and then I'll be done. So there's three more to do. I'll probably just do it over... Well... I'll do it later today or I'll do it tomorrow. I'm going to finish it up. I'll be done. For C++ and VSC, how do you launch your application after compiling? So, how would I launch it after compiling? It depends on how you want it to be launched. So, if you want to debug it, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, if you're using the Test Explorer, it's kind of built in, which is cool. You can uh, just type debug. Now I just launched it. It ran successfully, so I didn't get any breakpoint. If I broke it, though, and then built it, and building with F7, by the way. Now when I r run debug, then we get to the breakpoint where um, the test failed. All right, that test failed. 
so we got a breakpoint. So there, I was running it. Now, if you mean run like run without the debugger, then um, usually I just go to the command line, like to one of these, and I just run it. So it would be my build folder, and then, I don't know. Let's just run moon unit. There, I just ran it. Command line, right? If I really wanted to run it inside of VSC, usually it's, I only want to run things inside of Visual Studio Code if I'm debugging. So I'll either use the debug built into the test framework, or if it's not a unit test, um, you still go to the debugger um, screen here and you just have to set up a launch configuration. So here's an example one that just runs a moon unit. And if you click like this drop down add configuration, it'll add an empty one. And you pick like um, Windows launch. And just and you have to fill in the 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 name that you want the path to the program and you can use workspace folder as part of that path and any command line arguments you want environment variables etc cetera, etc cetera. once it's set up then it becomes um pull um uh, something in this pull down menu and you just hit hit that button and it goes boom done so if I had a breakpoint set up uh where would I put that in like render no. Runner. Cvp. So, like, if I wanted to see that, I would just hit that button now. Now I'm there in Moon Unit. So, yeah, if you're talking about running it in VSC, it's either a launch configuration, and I usually would do it with debug, or I just use the tightly integrate the one that's integrated here. They use that. That button there that looks like a bug or this debug thing, either way. Um, there's, there's a way to run stuff without debugging too, right? I think it's this, is it this one? That's the debug console. Start without debugging, so um, you can just use that menu option, that works too. But I hardly ever do that. If I'm not debugging, I'll probably just run it on the command line. That's much simpler than you thought. Yeah, and same thing in Visual Studio. Um, usually, you set, you tell it what project, and then you just tell it, "I want to, I want to run it in the debugger." So it's either start debugging or start without debugging. I think even in Visual Studio, it's at F5 as a shortcut for just, just start debugging, whatever um, you have selected. In Visual Studio Code, you have to select it with this thing. In Visual Studio, you have to select it by saying like "start project," select a start project. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to call it here because there's there's enough left that it's probably going to take me at least an hour and I need to eat something before I go. So actually, I'm kind of out of time to cook. <laughs> I'll have to get a quicker lunch. So yeah, when I come back tomorrow, I'll have either I'll either be finishing up this path, these last two on the list, or I'll be um, or I'll have done that during trick-or-treating hours, maybe. And if I'm done, once I'm done with the testing, I'm going to go back to George, and the next thing I'm going to work on with George is to fix his agro, agro, agro algorithm so that he does not aggro monsters unless they, unless there's a path to reach them within a certain limit. So um, the limit would be pretty short, like three or four squares. And so then if a slime is walking around here, he won't draw aggro because there's no path there from up here. So that's the next goal after I get the unit test done, which should be probably another hour. So, yep. Oh, interesting. Twitch is telling me seven minutes ago, polls are now available on my dashboard. When I need a quick way to ask the community a question, just use the polls widget. Well, I already have something in Yada to do that, so I didn't need that, Twitch, but thank you very much. I thought George was a player, so he didn't talk to you. Oh, yeah, it kind of looks like one, but no, he's an NPC. Yeah, just Twitch told me there's a polling thing built into Twitch dashboard now. Anyway, I'm going to go eat, so let me find someone to raid and wish you all guys all uh, a goodbye until tomorrow. Oh, to who to raid? How about Spheris? Because we raided Tim recently, right? Actually, let me hold on. Let me look back at the list. I'm gonna make sure that there there are a few people that I would like to raid who hardly hardly ever stream. I don't see any of them in the list though. 
Yeah, see you, Whitmock. Thank you for being here. Wait a minute, is Fierce actually developing or is she playing something? I gotta wait for an ad now. Nick's dev. I don't know Nick's dev. Let me consider that for next time. Uh, consider raiding in the future. If you guys want me to raid anyone, um, if I don't know them, I'll just put them on the list here. I haven't. I don't know. I haven't, don't know about Nick's dev. I'd rather watch their stream to make sure it's something that I feel comfortable with raiding, and then raid them the next time if that's okay. How do I have them followed then? I don't know. I didn't know about. I don't know who Nick's dev is. Cool. Um, let me check one more time. Yeah. Okay. We'll raid Spheris. I'll I'll consider I'll I'll check out Nick's dev stream and then maybe we'll consider for next time. How about that? But yeah, I haven't checked them out yet. So Spheris is a twi uh, a Twitch game dev who is using Unity to make a cyberpunk ARPG. So it looks like today she's doing some uh, Blender work, designing the three D model for it looks like a gun of some kind. Looks kind of cool. So I hope you enjoyed that and. I hopefully will see you tomorrow morning for me. 1700 hours UTC, okay? So have a great rest of your day and thank you for being here. Bye.